your continued support of the commission, your district commissioners, uh, the, the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, and all their employees. So we welcome you all. I also welcome Commissioner Storm, who's here with us today, and Deputy Commissioner Walter, where she, she's over there, Chief of Staff Clark, who's here with us, and uh, and our, our staff attorneys. So I want to welcome them today, too. Before we do the invocation today, I, I want you to recall with me today that 75 years ago, yesterday, and into today, uh, 175,000 Allied troops hit the beaches of Normandy, France. At the end of that 40, first 48 hour period, 4,000 brave Americans would not come home. Of the 16 million people from the United States that served in World War II, there are only 450,000 alive today, and we're losing those men at the rate of about 400 a day. So I would encourage you, as we get ready to have this invocation, 
to take the opportunity to thank one of them, or for that matter, any active military or any retired or any reservist, because for us to be able to hear this invocation today and make this Pledge of Allegiance, somebody shed blood for us all. So please keep that in mind today. The invocation today is gonna to be delivered by Third District Officer Christian Casper. Christian, raise your hand there so they can see you. And then the pledge is gonna be led by Sixth District Officer, so your Third and Sixth District Commissioners can swell up a little bit, by Officer Matt Hartley. So we're proud of our law enforcement officers for their dedicated service also, kind of like our servicemen. We're, we're, we're proud of their dedicated service and for the responsibility they've taken on today. And it's not only a great privilege, but a big responsibility to deliver that. So Officer Casper, if you would, would you lead us? Yes, sir. Let's, pray. Let's all stand, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for blessing us with the opportunity to hunt, fish, and enjoy the great outdoors in our commonwealth. Lord, I pray for guidance and direction to the men and women who are gonna plan for the future of these resources. Lord, I pray that you blanket and protect our law enforcement officers across the state, keep them from harm. And in this week of remembrance, I pray the same for our military personnel stations around the world. It is in Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, gentlemen. <coughs> you may be seated. Now I know why he's got to replace Jeff. He's a lot shorter than he was. Before we get into the business of the commission, I'm going to ask the, the commissioner, Rich Storm, if he'd like to make a few comments and maybe some presentations. For the sake of time, I'll be brief today. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, it's uh, certainly peak season. We're, we're all happy to be here. We have a lot of good things going here with the department right now. I want to remind you, it is the perfect time to uh, buy a hunting or fishing license <laughs> for your fathers out there, or Kentucky Wild membership, or sponsorship, keep that in mind. Um, Thank you all again for being here today. Uh, I hope you have safe travels. We have a lot of partners, special guests here today. I do want to remember Gary Williams uh, with the UBK. I've been informed he's in hospice care. Uh, Gary's been somebody that's worked with this department for years, years and years, so keep him in mind. Um, we have a lot of special awards today. We're gonna actually move, since we have a crowded room, we're gonna take those pictures outside today. Just want to let you know. So we are going to start off with uh, employee awards and service pins. I'm first going to announce those that are not here today. We have Greg Buckert, five-year service. Um, Adam Martin, fisheries division, five-year service. Noah Nelson, wildlife five-year service. Carrie Blake, 10 years wildlife service. Wesley McFadden, 10 years wildlife service. Pat Brannon, 20 years law enforcement division. Robert Calvis, 20 years service wildlife division. Jason Russell, 20 year service fisheries division. Chad Nickel, 20 year service fisheries division. Lucas Tucker, 20 year service, law enforcement division. Will Conley, 30 year service, INE division. So you would give those folks an applause. <laughs> We're fortunate enough to have seven of our employees today that will receive service pins. And if you all would um, just walk up here as, as we give out these pins, we have Lori Shute. I&E Division, five year service. We'll give her an applause. <laughs> we have Nathan Brooks, five year service, I&E Division. Megan Bagby, 
I'm here to service, admin and service. John Gutzeit, five year service, I need a vision. Dave Frederick, 20 year service, wildlife division. Thank you, Lieutenant Commissioner, Mr. Chairman, and the uh, commission members that are here today. Thank you for this opportunity. We're here today to recognize some pretty special individuals in, in the state of Kentucky. They are NAFS competitors, and I'm going to give you the bio of each one and then ask them to uh, come up for their recognition. T. Sanchez from Hopkins County Central High School and uh, Coach Dave Starks, if you're here with him. He's a graduating senior. He shot a perfect 300 in 2018 and 2019 in competition. So not just out in the backyard hanging out. Competition, pressure, guys shooting next to you, everything right in the yellow. 300. Fourth Kentucky, he was fourth Kentucky NASP at the state tournament first of the Kentucky NAS, NASP IBO and 3D Challenge. So let's uh, welcome and show our appreciation for T. Sanchez. Come on up. say a few words when we get done with this. Yeah, Lisa, please, come on up. Next recipient is uh, Paige Robbins from uh, Simon Kenton High School. Kevin, if you want to come up. Uh, and I guess coach is Coach Glenn Keith here? Or any of the other coaches that want to come up? Uh, in 10th grade this year, another she shot a perfect 300 in the 2019 season also. I'm just amazed by that. Um, first Kentucky NASP uh, State Tournament, fifth at the NASP Eastern National Tournament. But... Um, Let's uh, recognize Paige and her coaches for that tremendous accomplishment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
tell everyone run to the back. Sure. I do because I'm tall. Congratulations, Paige, and coaches, and I'm sure parents and all the other supporters are there. And uh, I just learned that Paige has double uh, challenges and, and stress and pressure because her dad is also the coach. So I think a number of us have been fortunate enough to experience that, and we're thankful for that. Um, I, our final recipient who's here today is Henry Thompson from Anderson County High School. Uh, Jeff, if you want to come up. Uh, and Coach Dave Frederick will come up for another photo. Uh, in 10th grade this year, she was second in the Kentucky State Tournament. She was first in the Kentucky NASP, IBO, and 3D Challenge. Pardon? He, I'm sorry. I apologize. What's she looking <laughs> Miss Weevil, my English teacher, would not be proud of me for not working my pronouns the right. Um, so let's first at the Kentucky. He was first at the Kentucky NASP IBO 3D Challenge, and he tied taking top honors after he, he won the shoot off. So there's the pressure of the competition, and then there's the pressure of the shoot off, where everybody in the whole facility is watching two or three people shoot off, and uh, the ability to focus and execute um, on that level is quite remarkable. I don't know how many of you in here have ever shot sporting clays or shot skeet, and that it, there's that one time when you're up to 21 or 22 and you're like, this is the one, I'm gonna break 25 in a row, and you miss the next one. <laughs> Happens to me. First NASP, uh, national tournament, and that was the three-way tie with, with a score of 299. So, one point away from being a 300. Uh, taking top honors after winning the shoot off. So, Quite a remarkable accomplishment. So Henry, congratulations and thank you. thinking of, and, and they are, we are in awe in NASP, we are in awe of these young people that they can take this sightless bow without releases, fingers, and no doodads on that thing, and just send them down range like they were lasers. They, people watch them shoot when they're going to shoot, and they just do a terrific job. They help through the process and, and the training. But as I was sitting there listening to this, I'm, I'm, I was taken back to uh, 2001, late 2001, when this commission was trying decide whether or not a whole bunch of folks were different. This fellow wasn't, but uh, was, was trying to decide whether or not this effort should go forward to try to create an archery in the schools program called Kentucky Archery in Schools at the time. And I'm thinking that maybe T might have been a year old when they said yep. And the rest, and Paige and, um, and Henry probably weren't born yet when you all decided to make this, create this path that sent them to this kind of glory. 
and they have money in, in a, an account with us, uh, with us now, lots of it, to go to any kind of post-secondary education they want to go. Some of these kids will have $50,000 in their account before they graduate, and mm -hmm. it's thanks to you folks for directing us to do this. <coughs> thanks. Yes, thank thanks, Roy. <laughs> John is usually not hard to work. This, 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 this. Well, isn't it a great, a great thing to, to honor these great employees dedicated to the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife? So we congratulate all those. And isn't it also extremely refreshing to honor these young people? Uh, as we all know, that's the future of, the, of conservation, the future of the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife is based around getting these kids involved. So it's a real honor to have these kids here today and their coaches who we, we talked about before we started, how patiently they, uh, how patiently they are with these kids and uh, they dedicate a lot of time and their service to, to helping uh, these, these kids at the archery range. So, so thank you all for that. And I noticed that the district commissioners who stood up here with the people from their districts who won stuff, uh, they were real proud of those two. And, I want to go ahead and ring my bell a little bit. The, the national winner, the national winner of the NAS program, and I guess, Mr. Grimes, didn't they have about 8,000 people competing in the final or in, in this, this year? Yes, sir. Uh, 16,188. 16,000, and the winner, his name Morgan Ruckles, is from Gulaski County, and that just happens to be my <laughs> district. So, although he could not be here today, we're going to honor him later. So. These district commissioners who stood up with the students from their place, uh, from their districts, uh, are they're proud, but I'm also proud of Mr. Ruckles, who could not be here. He and his mother and father today are were baling hay for the last week, and I doubt they're baling hay today because of the weather conditions. So uh, that, that that's a real, real pleasure for us to make those awards on behalf of the commission and on behalf of the department to those kids. Okay, before we get started on on commission business, and I know we, 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 we're still rolling along pretty good. We've got a few housekeeping reminders. Uh, I know we have these each time, but it, it, it behooves us to go over them again. First, if you would, uh, silence your phones uh, if you've got them with you. Let's see, have I already done mine? Yes, I did. Please silence your phones. If you have to make a call or it buzzes, please step out to do that. Um, <coughs> You know that if you were here at the May committee meetings, we were here until about 4 p.m. for committee meetings. I have been on the commission now three years, and I believe that's the longest I've ever had to stay. So in the interest of time, we are going to try to hold those who have signed up, and I haven't seen the list yet of signees for, for different remarks they want to make. We're going to try to hold you to two minutes. I, and I want to stress that the commission, and I know the department, both legal staff, uh, wildlife, fisheries, admin, they all cherish the, the comments and the suggestions and the concerns of people outside of the department. So the sportsmen and sportswomen, we welcome the comments, we welcome your emails, but a two minute rendition at the microphone, I assure you, is not as effective in getting the attention of these commissioners and the department as an email, a conversation on the telephone with your district commissioner, and if you've looked online, you know that their names and their emails are on, online, and they're anxious to take a call or, or an email from you. And they can, and same way with these handouts that some people do, we've got a lot more time to sit down and digest your concerns and, and your questions or your suggestions easier than we do two minutes at the microphone. And I know people want to do that, and, and, and that's okay. But understand, uh, we first welcome all those comments and suggestions, but you're really better off in the long run to use the email system, use uh, correspondence. If you still sort of stamp, I think a stamp now is, what, 50 cents or something. If you want to send a letter or bring handouts to these things and just pitch them on your way out or, or let us take them home and read them, it, it would be very good. And, and again, we welcome those. Um, uh, so if, if uh, we have these two minute, these two minute uh, comments at the microphone, we're going to have a, I think, 
Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. I don't know what the fuss is about. <clears throat> Last uh, month's committee okay, meeting your time wasn't, is up. Wasn't, <laughs> any long, wasn't any longer than the rest of them I've sat through. No, no it's four o'clock. We, yeah. we, we're usually done. All of mine's been four o'clock. I've just been to one. Oh, okay. I was going to say, I, we're usually done about noon. <clears throat> so we'll try to expedite those. But, but understand, it's not that we're wanting to cut you off from talking, but. It's, it's more effective with emails, and, and we all answer those emails. I think we've got the timer up there that Mr. Kelly is showing you, so it's not we're trying to be hateful. It's just trying, we're going to try to get everybody home without having to undo their knapsack and, and set up a, a personal tent. Um, so we've done our special uh, presentation. So at this point, uh, commissioners, we, we need to look over the uh, approval of the March 10th, 2019 commission meeting uh, minutes. Uh, that should be attachment M1 in your handouts. Uh, so we'll first uh, entertain a, a motion concerning the commission meeting from uh, March the 10th. You need a few minutes to look them over. If there are any additions or uh, corrections to them, uh, we'll hear those now. Move to accept the minutes as written. Second that motion. Okay. We, we have a motion from uh, Commissioner Carlos and a second from uh, Commissioner Eaton on accepting the minutes of the March 10th, 2019 meeting. All in favor of signify by aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. Our second action item is approval of the May 10th, 2019 admin committee meeting minutes, the public relations committee meeting minutes, the fisheries committee meeting minutes, and the wildlife committee meeting minutes. <laughs> oh, that's hard to say real fast at any rate. Uh, if you want to look over those, um, we can take those separately or make any corrections to them separately, or we can take them as a unit of committee meetings for approval of the minutes. I'll make a motion we approve them as a whole. Okay. Second. We have a, a, a motion from Commissioner Eaton to accept the minutes as they are presented uh, from the May 10th meeting, and a second from uh, Commissioner Carlos. All in favor or any discussion before we go on? All in favor, aye. Uh, opposed, no. Motion carries. Good. Uh, any old business that anyone wants to bring up at this time from uh, previously discussed items? Commissioner Horn, did you have something that you wanted to bring up? Uh, they're still looking into the minutes to see what was approved. So we'll wait till we hear back from them on that. Okay. So, you, so you've had your query answered about... They're still looking into it. Okay. Okay. So they're looking into that. Any other old business that we need to discuss before we move on? Okay. We'll dispense with any old business. The next is the administration, education, and policy meeting. Uh, Lisa Cox, we'll turn that over to you, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's a hard act to follow, <laughs> especially the financial. probably be mid-July, I will send out um, quarterly reports for you all to have and plenty of time before your committee meetings that are coming up in August. Mm -hmm. These are the same financials we had at the um, committee meeting. Did you all have any questions? I have a comment. Okay. <coughs> sure. Me being new and uh, on the admin committee, uh, I have called Lisa and talk to her about several things, and she's been very patient, especially about the queries I made about the WMAs and their finances, and uh, she's been very good to work with and very forthcoming, and I appreciate her patience. That's, that's great to hear. Uh, I, I, I can pretty much uh, echo that, that sentiment from the <laughs> commission's aspect. We, since Lisa came on, how long have you been now with us, Lisa, in this uh, position? This past Saturday was one year. One year. Uh, I have heard several other comments from the other commissioners, even though you're, you're, you're new to this, Mr. Morgan. Uh, others have said the clarity of what she presents is much greater. Everybody likes that. 
and appreciates the fact that she is very patient with those of us who do not know, know, know much about accounting to help answer our questions. And if she doesn't know the answer immediately, she looks it up or will call you back. So I, I can speak for the rest of the guys, I believe, when I say that her, her, her uh, attention to detail is great and that she helps us all understand where we stand. Well, Any other questions for Lisa concerning the approval of the the uh, quarterly financial statements? Make a, make a motion to approve the financial statements. Second. Second. So we have a motion from uh, Commissioner Horn and a second from Commissioner Swallows to accept the quarterly financial statements, uh, attachment AEP-1, as they are. All in favor signify by aye. Aye. Uh -huh. Opposed, no. Motion carries. Now, the informational item is, is your next thing, Lisa, if you want to explain that one to us. So, <clears throat> the state's budget is part of a biennial budget process, so beginning this fall, I will actually be starting on the budget for the um, fiscal year 21 and 22. And the budget is a bill that gets passed all the way through um, the House and Senate and signed into law by the governor. And so, our our budget for this upcoming year is already set as of for fiscal year 20 that starts July 1. Um, normally, the budget is approved because in August um, by the commission members, but um, we don't have a com regular commission meeting until September. So I will be sending those to you in plenty of time before the committee meetings, which we will have in August. That way, if you have any questions that you can um, pose those questions and we'll consider it draft and then I'll, I'll give you a final copy before the actual um, commission meeting. Um, if anybody has any questions or anything that they would like to see that maybe wasn't in the last um, budget presentation, I'd be happy to entertain those as well. Lisa, do you anticipate there'll be any major change? Uh, the way I kind of understood it from a few, it's pretty much running along just about the same, isn't it? it that's correct. Um, just like uh, in last year's budget, we, um, by each division's budget was presented, and at the base of that budget were things that they felt like would not be um, covered by the budget. Um, we had a, a fee increase both for licenses and for the registration fees for both, and so it was a straight line budget, and the budget didn't include those increases because we hadn't realized any of that additional income yet. So equipment needs, um, things, um, you, you said something about the WMAs, um, we have some properties that we can use our program income um, for equipment purchases. We bank that, but we can only keep it for five years. So there are appropriation increases that will be summarized just like there were last year, but part of that is that straight line process for the last biennial budget. So. And we'll walk through the, the entire budget document when the time comes. So are you going to send those out to everybody via email, or are you just going to present them at the next committee meeting? I will, I will send them out via email, if, the, if we can email them if they're not too large, right. um, or mail them before the committee meeting in August, so that you all have some time to look at it before you actually get to the committee meeting. Yes, sir. And that will be a draft document, <coughs> and then we'll talk about it soon. I then. think everybody agrees that Boy, it's pretty important that there's a lot there. And yes, it's, it's, there is a lot there. We, we like to look at it in advance, as much advance as you can afford for us to have. The, the biggest thing right now that I have on my plate to change is before we only presented the upcoming below capital projects, and I'm going to present an entire list of all the capital projects that we have, whether it be for voting access or for FELO, or I don't think we have any land acquisitions, but, you know, they'll be broken out that way so you all can see all of them. Any other questions that you have for Lisa at this time, other than knowing that she's going to get together this 2020 budget for you here before long? Everybody's good with that. And she's actually ahead. She, she's, this is ahead of where we were last year. If we, if we actually, budget. the management budgets, um, as the directors have presented them, are all already entered in the accounting system, and usually that doesn't happen until August or September. So there we go again, uh, Commissioner Morgan. There's, a, there's another feather in her hat for getting, <laughs> getting things getting things a little ahead of schedule. Exactly. And I don't believe it's where the commissioner is beating her with a stick or anything. I think she's just done that on her own. Is that about right? Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Okay. The next action item is uh, 
a man 301 KAR 2-185 Hunter Education, the attachment to AEP2. Uh, uh, that's for this one. Then. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, so I, I we'll get to that right after this one. If that's okay. Um, I didn't see him a minute ago. Uh, and so that'll be from Brent McCarty. Brent, go ahead. Sir. This time I don't have to ask you to move for a presentation. No, that's no. good. That's good. <laughs> no Dr. Carlos appreciates that. Absolutely. I think we've all learned all we can learn about Hunter Ed at this point. Right? Uh, anybody have any questions? Uh, you, you do have a, uh, a little snippet memorandum in your, uh, in your binder today just outlining some of the key points. But anybody have any questions for me? Okay. I think I should I'll probably point out that it was just to remind everybody, because you've heard this before, I know you have, so I apologize if I'm beating you over the head with anything, but it is in addition to our current options as well. I want to make sure everybody knows that. This is this is not replacing our current options, this is this is adding to our current options. Yeah, I think uh, Commissioner wanted to maybe do them as two separate items, Act 9. That's, that's correct. That's so correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. Did it make so a motion for the first, ask yeah. for a motion for the first one? I, I'm going. I'm going to wait on defer that just for a minute because these people probably will want to speak before we we conduct a vote on those, right? Yeah, right here. Usually get a motion and a second, and then we have time. Yeah. Okay. 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 So I, I just don't want those of you who wanted to speak don't, don't think that we're going to forget. Uh, Brad, I will say that I, I believe in my three years, your presentation was the, one of the most thorough that I believe I've heard since I've here. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> both times. Uh, so so. Are there any questions for, for Brent at this time? And we'll entertain a motion, then we will come to discussion because I've got about four or five people signed up that want to speak for a minute or two. So, uh, in, any any further questions for him from the from the commission? No. A any motions on the floor? I make a motion on uh, the first part of yes. the two part, and yes. that is the uh, online course only option of Hunter Ed. Mm -hmm. I make a motion to. Uh, Accept this. And is there a second to that? I would second that. Okay. So Commissioner uh, Commissioner Eaton has made a motion that we accept the the amendment that says add a subsection to 301 KAR2 185 section 4 that will allow a student to receive their Hunter Education certification without having to complete an in-person course of live fire. And that's been seconded by Commissioner Morgan. Now, discussion among the commissioners, or is there none? Then I'll, I'll call Raphael first to, to the microphone. Raphael, if you don't care, again, state your name and the city from which you are, and the district if you want to. Good morning. Uh, are you on? Are we on? Good morning. It's for, it's for the hallway. Okay. Oh, good morning. My name is Raphaelito Freighton. I currently live in Lexington, Kentucky. I am a hunter dead instructor in Nicholasville, uh, Kentucky at the time. In 1997, I was a personal computer salesman. Uh, statistics then showed that out of 100 homes, there was one home that had a personal computer in it. Today, those numbers have drastically changed. Out of the same 100 homes, there might be one home that does not have a personal computer or computing device in it. Having been raised in New York City, hunting was not one of my things that I learned as a child. However, when I moved to Kentucky, it quickly became the foremost of my interest. I can remember looking online for ways to prepare for this new adventure in my life. Most of what was available at that point seemed to be vague and really not steering me in the right direction. It wasn't until I found out the law requires one to have a Kentucky Fish and Wildlife orange card in order to hunt in some places that I found the Hunter's Ed class. The class was great, informative, and fulfilling. It helped that one of the instructors was a conservation officer himself. Yet it left lots of questions in my mind. This is exactly what many classes should leave in the student, the desire to understand the things within a picture of the class paint. As you consider this online only option for Hunter's Ed program, we need to remember that those classes will prompt more students to find the answers to the questions the course will bring up. By offering an advanced training option to these, to these classes, and using the existing Hunter Dead instructors as a better hunting experience could be guaranteed. I myself, for the first time in three years, finally found myself harvesting an animal for the first time opening day of turkey season. And as I sat in that blind for the first time and realized that turkey was to the left of my blind, it was the voice of that turkey biologist who spoke at that advanced training class that walked me through not simply 
citing that turkey, not simply calling it in, but everything that happened afterwards. And an hour and a half after that turkey was harvested, I was still shaking in my boots because <laughs> I realized for the first time in my life, everything that I had set out to do had worked. I believe, gentlemen, that I am the witness of that this program can and will work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Lee. Good morning. Good morning, sir. My name is David Lee. I'm from Lexington, Kentucky. David, get the, the mic. They picked you up out in the hallway. I'm 42 years old. I'm a husband, father of six, a veteran, and a hunter and angler. Thank I grew you, up sir. in a non-hunting household in Prestonsburg, Kentucky. Seven years ago, I got my orange card. Two years ago, I found Field of Fork and Angler's Legacy Program. After attending a turkey Field of Fork, uh, I knew a floodgate had opened. So what tipped the scale? Why wait five years and take up something new at 40? The programs mentioned above uh, and the mentorship provided sped the learning curve, a must for any busy adult. Mentors have the ability to improve your knowledge in the moment when it matters the most. Human connection adds to the depth of successes, can be comforting to the hardships, and makes an experience more relatable. I'm confident in saying I wouldn't be nearly as capable in the field without uh, Kentucky Fish and Wildlife's Field of Fork and Angler, Angler Legacy Program, nor would I have had more than half a dozen people either ask me to take them to fish or hunt. And finally, with an online education course and mentorship focus program, I feel that my peers can complete the requirements to hunt on their own time and still learn firsthand good habits in the field with me or a mentor and hopefully on a successful hunt. Uh, I'd like to especially thank Easton, Andrew, Becky, Chase, Courtney, Olivia, and Justin. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Jed Hayes, sir. Good morning, Chet Hayes, League of Kentucky Sportsmen. Um, I'm here once again to express the concerns of our membership as far as uh, we support the Hunter Ed program, of course. We support this agency all the way. But uh, our feedback from our members, our board of directors, um, many, many are, of whom are Hunter Ed instructors, past and present, uh, do not support the idea of anybody going hunting in the state of Kentucky with an orange card that hasn't been earned with some kind of firearm proficiency. So I have to relay those uh, those feelings of our membership to everyone here. Um, I know there's a lot of other things driving this. Um, I know it's important to get new people in the field and new license holders. We, we recognize that. So we know that um, other states allow this and some of those folks can come to our state and hunt. We recognize it. And we also know that some of our folks can take these online classes without any uh, firearm proficiency from another state and come here and hunt. But we just, uh, our feedback from our members does not support that. Uh, we also feel like the, um, a bare bones, it's not a bare bones, but uh, coming back after you've got your orange card and taking these follow-up classes uh, for tree stand safety, sighting and a rifle, any of these things, we honestly feel and our membership has told us uh, that's not going to happen. When folks get their hunter ed card, they're going to go hunting. We're not going to see them again. So we don't we don't believe in the validity of the uh, advanced classes. We don't think that's really going to happen. Um, I'm just here to share the thoughts of the sportsmen and women that we represent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. <coughs> Tina Hitchner. She's she, she right here. Morning. I'm Tina Hitchner and I live in Danville, Kentucky, which is in the 6th District, and I would like to talk with Greg for a minute thank you. Chad took care of I have been a longtime hunter and fisher. I grew up in that and hunted and fished with family. We also deal with 4 H shooting sports, and I've taught the 4 H shooting sports for 25 years. It's also a Y Hat program, which is the Youth Hunter Education Challenge program. But the department used to be part of that, they have been since gone. And uh, that takes the advanced hunting to the extreme. And that puts the people out in the field learning orienteering skills, rifle skills, wildlife identification skills. And those skills can also be transferred into adult classes. 
that can go on and will to some to some extent. I have had several classes in the past. I've put out sign out sheets. I've asked them, what do you want to learn? Half of my class every time responds with something that's in those classes they would like to see a class of. So I'm putting together a class for advanced hunting and we're going to do that this summer. And we're going to show how it can work and how it will work for our youth and our adults in our community. So the Kentucky can once again be a great state of decision. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I'm sorry I can't quite read this writing. Is it Gria Bout? Gria Bowdy. Gria Bowdy. 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 Mr. Bowdy. Sorry, Mr. Bowdy. <laughs> They, they say Clinard, Clinard. I, I've heard them all, so I, I'm kind of used to it. I'm, I'm sorry that I've made you aware. Somebody. That's okay. Most people don't get my last name. I'm not <laughs> concerned about that. Um, my name's Griff Bowdy. I live in Lexington, Kentucky, the 6th District. I'm a volunteer hunter ed instructor and also a leader in several different conservation outdoor organizations. I teach in Fayette, Anderson, Scott, and Woodford County, hunter ed. Um, I'll be honest today, I was coming with both my barrels loaded and I was gonna blast them, honestly, one at Brant and one at Jeff Eaton. But something happened this week to made me really rethink that. Someone dear and close to my heart, another hunter instructor lost her mother. And um, those, I lost my, you know, having lost my brother last summer, I know what that's like. And um, when people show up for a visitation funeral or even send a card, that means more to you than anyone passing in the hall and saying I'm sorry for your loss. So uh, to that, I want to acknowledge both Brent, Olivia, and Jeff Eaton for showing up for that person. And because as Kentuckians, we're, we're in time of need, those things matter more than our differences. And to that end, uh, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank all five of you for your comments and for the comments that we've heard both through emails, the other commissioners, myself, the passion of both sides of this issue does not go unnoticed by the commission. So I can tell you we appreciate those of you who are instructors, those of you who have clubs with several instructors in them, and we appreciate the passion of both sides of this issue no matter what, because all of you have the best interest of the children and the people who do not know how to do their orange cards safely. We appreciate the fact that you all are working so ardently to, to make this good for, for those people. So thank you, uh, both sides of this issue. Yes, sir? I apologize, I didn't get to sign in and I drove almost two hours to come up here this morning. It's okay. pouring rain and, and We'll still put you on the two minute. What's your name, sir? Hart. Thomas Hart. Thomas Hart, okay. If you don't care, Mr. Hart, if you'll go to the microphone real quick, I'm gonna put this issue back over to the commissioners in just a minute. Sure. My name's Thomas Hart, by way of introduction, I'm a retired Air Force Colonel, hold a number of degrees. And thank you, Colonel, for your service. I said we were going to do that today, so thank you, Colonel, for your service. My privilege. Um, I hold a number of degrees, including a doctorate in education. My wife, Sarah, and I have both worked for young people and not so young people in the realm of education for a very long time. And we're both Kentucky Hunter Education instructors. And I am here this morning to speak in support of Vision Wildlife Resources' proposal to move Kentucky's Hunter Education Program from primarily classroom plus range day program to an online program. I, I want to focus kind of on the range days we've just been so focused on. Range days typically includes nothing more than a short walk in the woods to review safe firearm carry practices, cross the fence, shoot don't shoot scenarios, <coughs> coupled with the brief use of a weapon. There is no requirement that this day include the use of a firearm. My range day requirements here at Saleda would use crossbows. The firearms and pellet rifles are prohibited at Saleda. In the last range day I assisted with in Esco County did include a firearm. Each student got three rounds with a shotgun. Two students on firing line at a time, almost two hours cycled over the history of the line. This left just a few, not standing around time for the kids and their parents. My point here is range day is a little more than weapons orientation safety practice reminders. It is nothing more and contributes little to student learning about hunter safety. Our current hunter education program in no way imparts weapon skills or proficiencies to students. Our students focus on basic hunter orientation, safe practices in the woods, weapons, hunting laws, conservation practices, and a little first aid. 
as it should. And that is exactly what an online course should focus on. Teaching skills and proficiencies and specific weapons and in hunting particular game animals should be the focus of, of dedicated instruction, precisely what the INE is doing in this proposal. This dedicated skills instruction will be an opportunity to be an opportunity to re-engage our current volunteer instructors in their real strength and passion, which is weapon skills and hunting. Again, as a hunter safety instructor, I fully support this proposal to move Kentucky's basic hunter education program to a primarily online platform. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, tonight. Colonel, for your comments. Any other comments from the commission? Oh. I neglected to register for this, but I do have a short one. Okay. Go, go ahead. Please identify yourself again there, Mr. Richards. My name's Larry Richards. I live in LaGrange, Kentucky. I'm the president of the Tuckiana Chapter of Sparks Club International. And I am also a firearms and hunter safety instructor. I guess the range day depends on what you get out of it, what you put in it. When we send kids, and we do about you know 80 a year, when we put them through a range day, they get to shoot a shotgun, a rifle, high-powered rifle, uh, a rimfire rifle, a crossbow, and a longbow. They'll fire upwards of 50 rounds a piece, so the disparity between range days doesn't mean range day is a bad thing. Because quite frankly, it's a safety, it's a, it's a safety valve for us, because if, a, if an instructor sees a kid who is negligent with that firearm, he can correct that, and that, will, that child, that, that participant will remember that. Early learning is the strongest here. Uh, most of my membership is in favor of this, I personally am not, but I'll go with the flow here. I see it's going to happen, but we need to, we need to not just discount this range day idea. Even though it's add-on, uh, I agree with Chet Hayes on this situation. It, they aren't going to do it. I would also like, and this is just my personal opinion, I would also like to see a block of instruction on this online program in the CWD issue in this state. We need to get these kids early. We need to get them strong, and it needs to get in their, in their, on their plate and in their minds. And maybe they can take it home and get in their parents, too. This is a fight we have coming. We need to start it. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Any other discussion among the commission members? I, I have a, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. if I may. You may have the floor. Uh, a lot of the people spoke or from my district. Yes, sir. And um, uh, some people may think I'm the spokesperson for this. I don't know really how that happened, but uh, nonetheless, uh, I think by doing this, we're going to bring consistency across the state in teaching. Um, I also ask my conservation officers. I go there almost immediately with everything, and uh, they're for this, including our leadership. And uh, we're not taking away range days. Clubs and people can still do the range days. Brent? We want to encourage it. They, we're not taking it away. You can still carry it on. Uh, I did that in Casey County. They requested it through Brent's work. We got that taken care of. That's what they wanted. That's fine. Um, I'll remind all of us, we send 5,000 kids through camp every summer. They don't have one day of range. They have multiple days of range. So I would encourage children to go to our camps. Let's make it 7,000. Let's make it 8,000. All for that. But I do think the advanced training is going to work. The people that I have polled are waiting for us. There's a waiting list for these people on all the advanced training. They don't have enough people to train the folks who are signing up. So the advanced training is there. And uh, I just want to say my piece on that. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Any other comments? Chair will entertain a motion. Further business on this item. We've done had a motion. Sorry, motion. motion second. Right. Sorry, sorry. Let, let me review again. Who made the motion? Is it was second. Yes, he made the motion. Made the second. second. <coughs> Any further discussion on on number one? I'm going to reread read that for the record. Add a subsection to 301KAR2-185, section four, that will allow a student to receive their hunter education certification without having to complete an in-person course or a live fire exercise. All in favor signify by aye. Aye. Uh, opposed, no. Aye. No. We have two no's. Would you like your vote recorded for the record as those persons? They can't see that. You're okay with, with that? 
So I have two, two no votes. Then the ayes carry, motion carries. We'll go to two, number two. Brent, do you want to read that? Do you want me to read that? Uh, Remove the license exempt part. Yeah, I can read it if you'd okay, like. Um, and, and know that the effective date of this particular portion is going to be sort of contingent on when it gets approved by LRC. Um, so initially, when they first proposed this, we were shooting for um, January 1 of 2020. That's probably not a, a reasonable time frame at this point because of the, uh, how long it does take to get through the, the administrative review process. Um, and so we'll probably, actually, if I had to guess, and this is me guessing, is Mark Kramer in here? No, no Mark could probably give us a better idea. Karen, it probably looking more realistically at the new license year of March 1, 2020, uh, for this to be to be effective, I would, I would guess. So um, in, in essence, this will um, uh, edit the, or remove the, the license exempt portion. Right now, if you are license exempt, you're also hunter ed exempt. That means landowners hunting on their own property um, are exempt from hunter ed on their own property. That includes their children. Now we don't want to get every adult out there. We don't want to take someone who's 50 and say, "Hey, guess what? You've got to you've got to have an orange card now." But but the children of landowners, uh, we would like to see that happen, and we have had strong support both from our hunter ed uh, instructors and from the public when we did a survey on that. Um, very strong support, um, and so the the language would would mimic our current language of um, when we first started doing this. We said anybody born after January 1st, 1975 has to have a hunter ed card. Uh, that was, again, that was the children at the time. That was people who were, who were under 18. So I, I guess the language would say um, uh, it, if you are, were born after March 1st of 2002, um, you would be required to have hunter education certification regardless of whether you are license exempt <coughs> or not. Um, which would then include the children of landowners uh, on the, hunting on their own property. Okay. So the uh, the two would be consistent. Correct. Correct. Yep. Uh, just you know, that's the earliest effective date we could have would be would be March first. So that's we'd have to figure out who would be eighteen on uh, March first, twenty twenty, and then everybody under that would get it. Or do you? Get, I mean, it's up to your all discretion. It could be sixteen. It could be twelve. It could be you know, it, eighteen is not a hard fast number. Uh, that's uh, that's up to your all discretion. We can amend it. We can, it. we can amend it. And the, the committee was before the, the, the new committee. law went into effect that requires extra public uh, comment time and all that kind of stuff. So we would have would have been effective January first, but now we're looking at more realistically March first. So, so we got a committee. To House Bill Four is added to it, pretty much. That's correct. What you're saying. Correct. Yep. Which is not a problem. That's good. That's right. That's good. Okay. Yes, sir. Requirement someone born after 1986 or 85? 75. 75. 75. 75. So Unless you're like modified to go to 2002, <laughs> would that stay current? That would stay the same. So this is just starting. So landowner of, of now, if you're born after this date, whenever you guys pick, from then on, we'll need to have hunter ed. Is that going to cause any inconsistency or any confusion between the two? Having two different dates? Certain age, do you, do you put an age or put a date? All, all one and the same. Uh -huh. okay. Can't change your date of birth. Okay. <coughs> do, do we need to research this and bring it back to uh, committee so that we'll be consistent with age requirements? We we, we don't even need a date. All okay. we have to do is say that all children of landowners. Above age 16 are required to have a orange card and, and implement it as soon as it can be 
as in that first screw that put the radio out like a sprocket, then we don't ever have to fool with it again. Yeah. This is our third third battle. So uh, so all tall moves when you say that. <coughs> okay. We have a that's your motion. I have a motion. Any second to that? Do you understand the motion? Do you want to restate the motion? Above 15? Well, if you're below 15, you got to have somebody with you. So your dad could go out on the farm and he could shoot a drum and he would supervise. So, so after age 16, you can hunt by yourself. So if you're out there hunting by yourself on your own farm, you still have to have a lunch boat and a, a so forth. So then you seconded that. Did you second that, or the, does the I'll commission want to hear the hear hear it in its entirety again? I think I need to clarify one thing. Yeah, we're, we're still not talking about people who are adults already, correct? No. Or are we? No, we're not. We're uh, strictly uh, talking about people from the ages of six. Well, when you say 16 children to above age sixteen, that rules out. Mm -hmm. Okay, or above above the age fifteen. So that would include the ones that can already be by themselves in the, so, in the woods, correct? So, so non-landowner children, what age do they have to have a horn card right now? If they're born after they're yeah, they can five. get it at nine, but they have to have it at 12. Okay, when well, why would we not carry that through? Because they still technically have to be chaperoned with firearms. If it, we're saying it's over 16, they're already going to be with an adult. I mean. So are, are you saying then there's a gap between 12 and 16? I might have been answering that's about the age when you can hunt alone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you can hunt uh, big game like deer by yourself at 16. Yeah, you can I'm hunt small game um, at 12, though. Or is there an age limit? Well, 12, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then we, then we just changed the age to 12. 12. I was incorrect about them how having that situation. How far forward are you going with that, though, Terry? Uh, in other words, you're, you're getting ready to ask if I'm – Get exactly. this right. When do you consider them an adult? Right. Yeah. Right. So you're saying after 12, and the cutoff date to finally consider them an adult would be 18, 21, 17, 19. Yeah. We'll have to include them. Well, after there's that. a definition of an adult already in this state. 18. I said reach your 18th birthday. So that's that's up to the commission. We'll, we'll we'll entertain. Are you are you amending your own motion here? Yeah. So yeah. your motion then is to say that remove the license exempt portion of section number two. This would make it a requirement that all hunters in Kentucky who have who, twelve years and above to the point of two children two adults until they meet, reach their eighteenth birthday pass the hunter's education course before hunting. Until age. Okay. Meet a range. So until their eighteenth birthday. Eighteen is the number. I can do that. 18 is when they're considered an adult. Okay. Does everybody understand that motion that he's made? I do not have a second unless you made that second. Did you make that second? I, I will second that one. Okay. Because that's more clear to me than. So we have a motion by Dr. Carlos, seconded, seconded by uh, Kevin Bond, that I'm going to read this again. Remove the license exempt portion of Section 2. This would make it a requirement that all hunters in Kentucky. Born, uh, all, 12 years 12 years and older until the age of 18 <coughs> pass a hunter's education uh, before hunting until between 12 and 18 that are children of landowners that, yes well, I, I, let's see. that's the license exam. yeah that's already the, uh, yeah, that's the license exam. amendment that was already there so essentially, we're oh. not telling adults they have to get it at this point. Right. This is just oh, children. Just All in favor of that motion signify by aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you, Brent. I believe that's the that, Are you done, Brent? I think I'm done. Stephen Fortman. Stephen Fortman. Yeah. Great job. Mr. Thank Ron you. Brooks, the fisherman. Like, I, have, I have something I'd like to bring up in okay. the administration. Okay. As noted in the minutes of the administration meeting last time, uh, as a guest of the committee, I brought up the fact that in can, executive session. Pardon me for interrupting. Can everybody hear Dr. Carlos? We've got a little commotion. Uh, Dr. Carlos, you may, if you don't care, hold it off for just a minute till we kind of clear the room. They won't come up. And then, and then speak just maybe a little bit louder. Not the first time. <laughs> Mr. Hayes back there wants to be able to hear you, and I want him to be able to hear you. 
uh, last time in the administrative committee as a guest, I brought up the fact that in executive session, we do not keep any records or any form of minutes. I believe this is wrong, that we should have some records of proceedings in executive session. I recognize that there, when land purchases are being considered and so forth, that we don't want people to know that we're getting ready to buy something and so they can buy the stuff that's around us. I recognize all that, but all business that is taking place in the Commonwealth of Kentucky should be out and above board where people can eventually get the record of it. So I think that we should take minutes at executive session and keep a record of the proceedings of those sessions. Any comment? I'm, I'm going to ask. I, I'm going to ask for a legal update on on answering that query. Mm -hmm. uh, under the open meetings law, there's no requirement to keep uh, minutes for an executive session. That's to protect that open debate on confidential matters. Mm -hmm. If the body decides they want to memorialize certain parts of that conversation, they're free to uh, put those in the minutes. They come out of executive session and put a, a short version of what they want in the public record. So it's it's up to you folks what part you want to have as a free open debate, what part you want memorialized uh, for review. So how would you see that affecting land acquisitions and personnel matters that, that, uh, that are affecting the, the commission at that time, like land acquisition? You almost have to do an example of something that's not needed to be reviewed or memorialized. You know, if somebody had a strong objection to a sale, maybe that they wanted that in the record after the fact, and if the group agreed that that should be put in the minutes, that would be appropriate. So you're well, saying that when you come out of executive session, the things that you wanted noted in the regular minutes could be done that way, but can we also keep minutes of the proceedings uh, confidential Confidential on like land acquisitions or the things that we would fear for getting out no. or personnel issues? If you put pen to paper, that's eventually going to become public record. If there's something that you want memorialized, then put pen to paper. If you want to have open debate, the law allows you to have that confidential discussion and not memorialize the subsequent. So that would be a choice during during the this closed each session? Each individual executive session? Yes. That'd be okay. Right. Does, does everybody understand that as both Dr. Carlos has presented his concern and, and our attorney has? May, may I ask Harry a question? Yeah. Sure. Uh, and Evan, does that mean we can, we can debate about it and then when we finalize our debate, that can be to the public? but as far as our conversation doesn't have to be. Is that correct? Right. I mean, it's up to you to decide how much. I mean, the vote's always going to be public. Is that what you're saying, Harry? No, I, I think that all business that we carry out should be part of the public record at some time, well, I'm, at I'm, some point in time. I think my question is, do you want what we finalize in that meeting to be on record? I, I want minutes taken. I, I believe that Robert's Rules of Order says that we have to keep minutes of the proceedings and the law says that this commission has to operate on the principles of Robert's Rules of Order. So not being an attorney, I'm just a country doctor, but I believe that we're not fulfilling our legal obligation by taking uh, time out and going in another room and discussing something and not ever having what we discussed in that room available to the public. I think I'd be okay with the finalization of that. I just don't know that the debate needs to be uh, public. And the finalization always will be because the vote has to be public. You always yes. have to come out of executive right. session to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let me ask you but, this, Evan. No, none of the votes on any of the land we purchased are public. Just the end, just the we come out of land. executive session, we vote on it, but the land's not described. At that time, we eventually will be, of course. Do you, would you foresee with a personnel issue any problem with litigation? In other words, somebody suing the department or the commission for exposing a personnel issue that was discussed in executive session. So now we're, I'm off of land acquisition right. asking about a personnel issue. Would we be liable to, to some 
suit if we talked about a personnel issue that became public record. I'm not objecting mm -hmm. to it becoming public That's record. That's hypothetical. I, I, it's difficult to answer. Sir. Yeah, I, I'm more but concerned with are we liable for a suit in the event that we're discussing a personnel matter that then gets out. Uh, well, with personnel, usually you're talking about hiring or disciplining. Yes. And both of those involve confidential matters. So if you're talking about somebody's privacy, there's always concern with about making that public record. And that's why the exemption exists, so that you can talk about confidential matters, come out, and make a public result, which, which is chosen to do with that information. Okay, so if I understand correctly, Dr. Carlos wants to go on the record that he has a concern about that and wants us to look further into that. Is that correct? You're not asking for any That's kind correct. of public I now. I you recently found out that there's no record of proceedings that take place in a executive session. And uh, that upsets me because I don't want the appearance that we are doing things in secret that can never be uncovered by anybody. I agree. Okay, so... Is it okay then with that comment that goes on the record I, I, that, that we're researching that or looking on the program? I don't expect resolution of this issue today. Yes. But uh, I want it on record that I brought it up <coughs> and that it, I'm concerned about the appearance of us doing things in secret and I want record, I would like to have record of this. Good. So you all will look into that. Yes, we'll try get, to get, get back. For you then. Maybe so. Next admin committee meeting, then yes. we'll have some discussion that's, of that's that good. again. Okay, thank you, thank you, uh, Doctor. Thank you for your time. Okay, Ron Brooks, thank you, sir, for you. being here today. Um, I've had one action item um, on 201, taking it fish by traditional fishing methods, and it has to do with the, the good thing, I guess. Uh, we're getting. Uh, we received 38,000 cutthroat trout from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service this year. And there are, we stocked them in the Cumberland Chell water in March. Um, these are a highly prized fish, uh, and we're really going to be limited on the number we can stock each year. So we'd like to kind of treat this as we do the brown trout as a trophy fishery. So uh, basically what we're asking is that uh, for, for cutthroat, um, basically emulate the... Uh, brown trout, trio limit of one, cutthroat daily, and it must be at least 20 inches long. And uh, in Arkansas, by the way, the state record is because of 10 pounds, so Jeez. this has got a potential to heap up on fish. I, I see, well, I see Commissioner Swallow salivating <laughs> over here. <laughs> so you all please forgive him, he's not having any kind of... He's not having any kind of health issue, he's just thinking about catching one of those big cutthroat trout. Right. How long before those fish reach that size? Um, it just depends on uh, growing conditions every year, each year. Okay. We'll know more in a couple of years on how well they can develop. Generally in the shell water, they do pretty well. So is it like five, five years? years or Probably at least five years. Okay. Ralph, you got to get I'll on make the season. motion. <laughs> approved. wonder why I knew <laughs> Commissioner Swallows would want to make that motion. Do I hear a second? Second. And seconded by Commissioner Fisher. I'm going to read this again so we know what we're talking about. This proposed uh, motion that has been made by Commissioner Swallows says to amend 301 KAR 1201, the taking of fish by traditional fishing methods, to include a proposed daily krill limit of one cutthroat trout that must be at least 20 inches long. Is there any further discussion? All in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Uh, the only other item we have is a two-part item, even though they both uh, are in regards to 301 KAR 1016, uh, and it is just a couple of discussion items. Um, they became discussion items after we had a couple of public meetings this last uh, couple of weeks ago, uh, both in, uh, for Lake Mr. Bashir and Lake Monroe. Uh, for, uh, I'll handle Bashir first. Um, for Bashir, we also had a meeting with uh, Dawson Springs. The, uh, the department's had a, a long time contract with Dawson Springs since 1962 actually, to where in order to get free water rights, uh, they would do certain things in return for the department. And those things really were dam maintenance responsibility and uh, their ability or their, they were uh, charged with enforcing and controlling construction on our buffers. Um, the issue with Dawson Springs uh, actually goes a little deeper than it would for our other department on lakes in that uh, along with uh, those responsibilities, the 
contract also allowed them to, to allow a lot more uh, construction on Dawson Springs than we would allow in our, normally in our department on lakes. And that was one of the reasons I think it was lost, uh, left off the original 016 uh, that was passed in, in 2010. Uh, but since we uh, have uh, concluded, uh, both us and Dawson Springs agree that they cannot enforce or control uh, the activities on our buffer. We agreed at the meeting to uh, for Fish and Wildlife to take over the responsibility like we do on the uh, rest of the uh, lake, the Department of the Lakes. Um, the problem is the same problem that we had in 2010 when we were trying to pass regulations where regulations hadn't been enforced for 30, 40 years. And that is that a lot has happened uh, on those buffer zones where um, we would never have allowed had there been enforced. So like we did in 2010, we're looking at probably trying to um, grandfather a lot of things that we would not normally allow on our buffer. Uh, for instance, they, they use U-shaped dots that with uh, covers on so they can put the boat inside and kind of like a slit. Uh, we would never allow that in any other department on the lake. Uh, since it, it appears that all but about four lots on the entire lake uh, have those structures, rather than just grandfather them in we will probably uh, be coming to you in August and during committee meeting to talk about uh, allowing that kind of structure on the lake this year alone. So what, the way I foresee 106, uh, uh, the amendments that we put to 106, is we probably have a special session for this year to acknowledge uh, the differences that uh, they have been allowed to do, that the people on, around that lake have been allowed to do versus the rest of our department on the lake. So it'll be a special circumstance based on the history uh, that we have put over here. So, uh, we are right now uh, getting a lot of data. Uh, and one of the major issues that we're, we'll be bringing up in August probably is whether or not we should be grandfathering dots that are, are, are built that uh, are not associated with any land zones. Uh, interestingly, they've uh, used Dawson Springs, like I said, they don't allow enforcement. So people have been uh, building dots even though they have no property adjacent to the lake. So that's going to be the biggest uh, contentious part, most contentious part of this uh, whole issue. And again, after we've uh, get done some assessments, we have some numbers, and uh, I'm sure we're going to get some lot of folks when we, when we get data. Um, we'll be taking care of that starting in August. So. Yeah, that's your first meeting? Uh, we had our first meeting. Uh, basically, about 200 people showed up. Um, they had heard everything from we were going to make them pull out every dot they had to, uh, you know, we weren't going to do anything. So that meeting really was a heads up to let people know that they shouldn't be panicking, that we're going to work with the public. Obviously, we don't want any, a lot of bad PR out of us either. Uh, and we want to try to accommodate folks who have not uh, been regulated in the past. And I can tell you, a lot of times, I, I had people come up to me after the meeting and say they tried several different avenues to try to get permission and permits. And uh, our folks would be telling them that, you know, Dawson Springs runs it. They go to Dawson Springs. Dawson Springs says we're not doing anything with it. They tried the county, and the county said they had nothing to do with it. So, to be fair to the folks who have built things that uh, otherwise would not be acceptable, it seems like many of them tried to go through the right avenue to get what they had. And when they found out that nobody's doing anything uh, against what they're trying to do, let's just build a dock and they don't own any property. Who would? So I I I uh, struggle with. How we're going to uh, do, um, how we're going to handle that issue. That's probably the, the, the biggest issue. So, and again, we'll get numbers, and uh, we'll, once we have the committee meeting, uh, if we come to some kind of uh, regulatory agreement um, in uh, August, then we'll have another uh, public meeting to let people know exactly what we're going to propose. Right. And that's pretty much it with Dawson Springs uh, on Lake Malone. Again, that. Uh, the people around Lake Malone really were the impetus behind uh, 016. They came to us and asked us to start uh, regulating our borders, our buffers, <coughs> and our boat docks because they were afraid people were going to start really building uh, uh, structures, uh, extravagant structures down bluffs and uh, on the water. And so uh, we worked uh, very hard. Uh, my predecessor, Benji Kinman, uh, worked very hard with the public to try to figure out just how that regulation should work to where we can grandfather folks in and, and still be fair to everybody in terms of allowing new structures to be built. 
And so that's where the current restriction came in terms of the number of steps that could be issued here, uh, a leading down on our buffer in order to get to above backward water's edge. Uh, and the request from, uh, uh, we had a public meeting uh, last week and the request uh, from uh, an individual on that lake that we double the number of steps, essentially making it unlimited to extend the permit limit more than 72 steps um, and allow uh, a couple extra uh, landings and allow construction down the side of the bluff. That really flies in the face of what the public, uh, is the whole reason why we really had the, the, the initial regulations request. So we had the public meeting and really it was very lightly attended. I, uh, fairly disappointed. We mailed out 416 letters uh, in order to try to reach out to people to come to the meeting so that we could uh, provide that uh, public notice that uh, there, we had this request. We were hoping to have enough people there to vote on it one way or the other and then bring that to you today. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there were really only uh, what about, uh, uh, I got the numbers here. Um, of those that showed, 11 were actually for the request, seven were against it, and five abstained. Uh, we also have received uh, now enough uh, emails that uh, basically, I think uh, we've had 18 return, more returns, and uh, most of those are, are not in favor of that request. It, and if I had to guess, I would have guessed that's, that's what we were talking about, meeting that the people showed up. So what would I uh, announce at the meeting is that because we didn't have the, uh, you know, out of four, over, over 400 boat dock owners on that lake and not uh, extra not uh, non boat dock owners, I told them since we didn't have a representative uh, number, obviously it wouldn't uh, pass any test in terms of uh, power to provide information. Um, we told them we was going to uh, send out um, uh, what is it, surveys to all the, the addresses with boat docks, as well as we're going to try to go to the PDA and get addresses of people that don't have boat docks, because uh, some of those showed up and they had not received a notice of the meeting because they were not in our database. But uh, they had to receive notice from word of mouth, basically. So we're going to try to hit them all with a survey and really outline exactly what the request is in the survey and ask them whether they're in favor or not. We'll use that survey. Uh, the ne hopefully we get it done before the next meeting. And uh, we, we like to do these concurrently so we can move on both things at once at the August meeting. And we'll bring you back the uh, results of that meeting in, in August. And uh, basically, uh, I guess then we can decide whether or not we want to move forward with this and have another public meeting. Uh, if we were going to change the regulation, we would certainly have to have another public meeting. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, since we're not, uh, if it would happen that we were not going to uh, change the regulation, I don't believe a public meeting would be necessary just to announce it. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Brooks? Thank you, Ron. Okay, thank, thank you. you for that update. Let's take about a 10 minute recess. We'll reconvene in 100 hours. Bless you, Jeff. 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 B
uh, patrolling the ramps in the campground. Are you ready? Oh, that's I, I, I think it's time to, I'm 10 minutes over my 10 minute break. Perfect. But, but thank you all for being patient to, to get started back. And I want to applaud everybody's efforts this morning to, we haven't drug anything out and I'd like to hope that we can continue that for the rest of the session this morning. I, I want to revisit uh, part two on the, the uh, motion that was made on, on non, uh, or on landowners. Let's see if I can find that. I'm sorry. I, let me go back. Admin. On the admin side of part two. Uh, Brent and uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Walder found a couple of glitches in that and they want to explain to you all what they feel like is a glitch in the understanding of number two in the pro proposal uh, recommendation of license exempt individuals. So which one of you all wants to talk first? You want me to go? Okay, so um, uh, while fantastic we got current children uh, 12 to 18 or future children 12 to 18, uh, the, the general idea will, was to get as many people 100 certified as possible, meaning that someday we would also like adult landowners to be 100 certified. Um, if we put a specific date as to when you were born on or after, then as people age, that would still continue to apply to them, whereas if we put an age range, um, someone could be 19, for instance, or 18 by property, um, be license exempt on their property, which is fine, of course, but then not be 100 exempt, which, which is not, uh, not the original intention. Uh, we would like to uh, put a date on there um, saying that, you know, we're, we're going to grandfather in adults right now, but as, as this progresses, that age uh, number will get higher and higher. Am I saying that correctly? Yes, okay. It's similar to how we have for every other individual. I was born after 1975. At some point, people were grandfathered in. I was not because I'm way too young to have met that 75. Yeah, right? me too. <laughs> We're honest and transparent in here. <laughs> anyway, so at some 16. point, you, we had to start that. And so what we're going to do for this, for anybody that's licensed and exempt, which includes landowners, their tenants, and their dependent children and their spouses, anyone born after January 1st, 2002, that meet the quality, that are licensed exempt, they're still licensed exempt. <laughs> However, they will need to have Hunter Ed certification. Does that sound okay with everybody? So, it so, gets 12 so you're year striking old. the verbiage bur 12 years old and older until 18 and replacing it with after January. Yep. It does too. So it's going to get our 12 year olds, our 13, 18, you know, yeah. so they'll follow the same rules mm -hmm. as an individual that's not hunting on their own property that after 12, <laughs> they'll need to have Hunter Ed exemption. With I the mean, Hunter, they'll have to have Hunter Ed certification after the age of 12. Does that with, sound all right? With the eventual goal of hopefully universal Hunter Education Certification. And he has it written out for, for us exactly so that we make sure that it, that motion, if it's okay, mm -hmm. I'll read it, and if somebody wants to take that motion, that's fine. But a person born on or after January 1, 1975, or a license exempt person born on or after January 2002 shall carry a valid Hunter Ed card while hunting in Kentucky. The exact language will work with the attorneys, but essentially that's how it would be. Does everybody understand the, the proposed amendment to what we just passed? Because that's what we're going to have to go back. We're going to have to go back and amend the motion that passed minutes ago to this little this little catch up on on uh, wording. Does I think it's the same intent, just different verb. That, that's exactly yeah. what it is, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Uh, you know, here's the deal. What we do wrong is we sit at this table and we decide that we want landowners' kids to have an orange card. And then when we make the motion, we try to write the law, and none of us are attorneys. What we should do, we should paint with a broad brush here. If we want somebody to have an orange card, we need to say, hey, we want them to have an orange card, do it. And not, you know, do it at 3 o'clock on a Sunday and, uh, and get mired down in all these details. That's why we have trouble with the uh, commission tags and stuff now, is that, you know, we try to write the law at the commission table, and none of us are qualified to do it. So we just need to say, paint in broad strokes, I'm okay with the amendment, I will amend my motion to say that, and, you know, I really don't care what you do, I just want landowners, kids, to have orange cards, and that's what 
we all want this table, and that's what we ought to say. Okay. So, so what I'll, procedure I'll, I'll, I'll do we need to do? Well, I'll yeah. entertain a motion to amend the previous uh, motion that carried minutes ago, so we uh, the minutes will reflect that it was today concerning concerning number two of proposed amended 301 KARC-185. And I believe Dr. Carlos has made that motion. And has it been seconded? Kevin, Kevin seconded. And, and, and Kevin Bond has seconded that. Mm -hmm. And now for clarity, would you read that prior to the vote? In other words, read exactly how the wording will be mm -hmm. instead of my reading it because I don't have it here before me. Read exactly how it, it's going to be reworded. And, and this is an amendment to the amended version that we had earlier today. So go ahead. And I, and I want to clarify one other thing. Pr uh, approval, I'm, I'm looking to our attorneys on this one. Approval of concept versus approval of exact wording um, is, is okay as well, correct? Okay, okay, okay. 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 Just want to make sure of that. Okay, okay. very good. So um, this is the whole, the whole shebang, guys. Um, a person born after January 1st, 1975, or a license exempt person um, born on or after January 1st, 2002, shall carry a valid hunter ed card uh, while hunting in Kentucky unless exempt pursuant to section three and there's more there's more involved with it than that uh, but that's the that's the part we're we're focusing on okay so then <coughs> my question was do we, do we need to add to this law or do we need to go into the existing and strike what the exemption is because the exemption right now is a landowner hunting on their own land so if we remove that exemption then all the other dates that are in place would take it in effect and carry it and Move forward. Thank right? Because 1975. We're not going to remove the exemption for landowner having a hunting license. No, the the orange card requirement. Yeah, which basically that's what you're. That's what that's the exemption you would have to remove is landowners hunting on their own land do not have to have an orange card except by the dates listed in there. Correct. So you're just yeah. removing an exception instead of us adding to it. Well, at that point, that out to the next one. Yeah. 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 Sure to make it more simple yeah. than <laughs> complex. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor of the amended motion, signify by aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries for the amended amendment. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, you sir. Thank Let's hop into wild. Mr. Garland, sir. <laughs> You're going to hop into wildlife? Absolutely. No pun intended. Okay. Frog season. Ready to go? Frog season. Our first uh, action item is amend 301KR 108T2 frog season limits. Um, we uh, had some uh, discussion in a uh, league resolution as far as concerned hunters and the bullfrog population of uh, across the state, specifically more West Kentucky. Uh, we look at what other states have done. Uh, since the committee meeting, I think you ought to ask for a little more information on the other state seasons and if they split zones in some of our northern border states and then some other environmental impacts, um, you know, to frog, possible frog declines, which we provided you all if you had time to look over that. Um, you know, there are several several issues, environmental issues uh, related to herbicides, pesticides, and then it's habitat loss that can affect any population of frogs, especially. Um, so, um, Y'all had a chance to hear about information, no more questions. Basically, the motion is to move the bullfrog season from the opener from the third Friday in May to the first Friday in July. Mr. Chairman, would like, I was going to point out one correction on the chart you provided. Mm -hmm. You said in Kentucky and Tennessee are the only states that were open in May. That's not correct. When you look at the bordering state of West Virginia, the counties that border Kentucky are also open. So that's a correction to the chart. Open in May. Yeah. They're open sometime, but is it in May? Or May the 19th through the 31st on the Kentucky yes, border. Sir, it is May the 19th. Oh, I'm sorry. I got you. Yep. So that's a correction right. to the chart. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm eventually going to make a motion that we protect the resource. But <laughs> I would like to point out this is our research uh, thing for this year. It has a picture of a bullfrog on the front. There is no research about a bullfrog in there. So the first first thing we ought to do is protect the resource if there's any question so I, I agree that we should change the season and uh, we should instead of having a conjecture about what's causing 
the demise of the Bullfrog in Western Kentucky. We should design a research project to study why they're down. Another cause that's left off the list is the great blue heron eating all the frogs walking around in front of the pond in Western Kentucky, and it wasn't when I was growing up. So let's let's find the real cause. Let's find it. We don't even know if they really are decreased. Right. We just know that some people say they don't see them anymore, including me. And uh, so let's let's find out what the truth is. Let's do the research. And in the meantime, let's protect the resource. I move that we change the bullfrog season as suggested. I got a comment. I went around my district and talked to all the clubs in the eight, and uh, the common theme and that I got back was access. If if there was water close to a road, close to a place to park, then the frogs were down. But in places, I had two farmers tell me that you couldn't hold the conversation by their pond for the frogs, but they were <coughs> walking a great distance from the road. So access had more to do with it in my district than anything. Yeah, and that's true of a lot of, a lot of cases. Yeah, so I don't think it would matter when your season was. If a guy's too lazy to walk over on the frog, you never ain't going to change. I'll, I'll reiterate your comments in the seventh. We've not, from what conversations we've had, we've not seen a decrease. So I don't know if we want to look at a division or we want to uh, have more research as to where, there's, where there is an issue and where there's not an issue. Um, Echo those same comments from the fourth district as well. They say, you know, there's plenty of frogs. And another issue that I think is, is a couple of things to point out. Um, if you look Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, there's a certain parallel that you're looking at from this point south. And then you compare it to these other states that are doing something there in the parallel north. And so I think there's a climate difference there as to their timing of their seasons, maybe more so than some of these other factors as well. Also, I uh, remember frog hunting from a time when I was a young man, so for more than 40 years, this frog season has been in and around the May 15th, and that is burnt in to the population pretty strongly. And uh, when now you suddenly jump it to July, you're going to have a lot of people inadvertently violating that have not checked that frog season date in decades. So, I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't know what the law is, but same time that that has been a, a stable in the in the hunting for years and years so but I'm not saying that we don't need to do something for the first district either is there a way that we do a zone or is there something like that that's possible or it is I, I mean I would recommend just for sake of confusion that we keep it statewide just uh, so I mean, well, the more splits we have it doesn't have a season date season can cause I know in the past with big changes in season dates and, and tagging requirements is absolutely right in the fact that we ought to know why before we change it, but I'd just like to know first. Can we table it until we find out why or get some more information brought to the commission? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I have one wow. question also about the yeah. first thing about <laughs> it's been <laughs> carved into <laughs> the <laughs> here. Uh, can we keep the tradition going if, if we wanted to as like the first weekend or the first week and then close it until I mean to give you a split season right. like you do the year Well the, the first order of business is we're gonna have to deal with the motion that's already been made. So either Dr. Carl is gonna withdraw that motion or I need a second to either pass on that or to defeat that motion and then hear the tabling ideas or motions. Just table so, it. I, I wanted well I, I wanted first got to deal with his motion. Well, I have a motion to listen like it dies for lack of a second. Well, it, well, if, <laughs> well, I haven't asked for the second, but if you withdraw it, you can withdraw that motion prior to a second, or we can ask for a second, and if we don't get it, uh, we can. I don't want to be the guy who shot the last play. <laughs> <laughs> you want to die? For, for, okay. Die for like then the chairman, the chairman rules the motion dies on the floor. Do I have a, another motion concerning how we're going to deal with the frog season uh, as it stands in this amendment? I just wanted to, Chris, to... 
Okay. So, so you do you want to table this? You want to make a motion to table this until we get further information? Absolutely. Okay. I have a motion from from Kevin that we table this. Do I hear a second? Second. I have a second from Commissioner Eaton. Any other further discussion on tabling this to get more Kenny research on it? Oh, Kenny, no. What did I say? You just made I'm Kenny sorry. a preacher. I looked down there past him. I'm sorry. Or I didn't mean to insult you, <laughs> Commissioner or not. Uh, okay, so I have that second. Is there any Best further discussion about this? Yeah. Y'all are getting punch happy. Any, any further discussion on that issue? But we are going to come back and visit it later in committee. Is that correct? We'll make that part of the record that we come back and visit that. All in favor, aye. Uh, Opposed, no. Motion carries. Ooh, that was a difficult one. We're just a couple of thoughts. Okay. Go ahead, Chris. The second action item is to amend 301 KAR 2090, a uh, means by which migrant board any birds may be taken. Uh, basically, the statute change allows us to take full um, uh, participation in the snow goose conservation order season by removing the three shell limits. Um, and so, Basically, we propose to remove that three shell limit for shotguns um, for the sn uh, snow goose conservation order season. Discussion? I'll make a motion we pass this. Okay. I have I have a motion and a second to, to pass this as it's written to remove the three shell limit on shotgun snow goose. The motion was made by Commissioner Eaton. It was seconded by uh, uh, Kevin Pond. Yeah. Excuse me, I'm, I'm going back. I'm still thinking about my error a few minutes ago. Uh, is there any further discussion on it? All in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed, no. That motion also carries. <coughs> Two discussion items, and I think I think Chris is going to do the discussion of these items. Just one. It's almost like an update item. Yeah. yeah. Basically, during the last during the committee meeting, uh, we talked about moving these items forward. To, you know, in time for next season, which would be August September season. Um, those include the. Uh, Allowing persons to take coyotes after daylight hours um, with a uh, rifle. Um, we just need a little more time to discuss that. I'd like to get some additional information from landowners. Uh, we've got some databases on uh, with some landowners that we've worked with over the years. Um, what was kind of discussed here was limiting that to March rim fire only on private lands with written permission. Uh, but given the potential issues with that from socially and safety, we'd like to just get some more information and talk to folks a little longer. On that. You were also going to talk to more law enforcement officers yeah, who have yeah, dealt with this in the past one. Yeah. I, I remember you saying that to me. Well, this is Commissioner Fisher's issue, or in his district, they're the ones who want that. Right. So we want to be satisfied that he, are, are you satisfied with the fact that he's going yeah, to do some more research? Yeah, I think we've got to have law enforcement over there. Yeah, I'd also like to talk to some of the other states around us that. Yes, sir. Chair McClinder, i got yes, sir. some things I may want to add to that. Um, Add to that as far as research or looking yeah, into just looking yes, into, and this this won't be your two districts, but if we go statewide, mm -hmm. I've talked with our conservation officers, and uh, they would like for the elk zones to be excluded, private and public, because it's just going to entice people to poach our elk. Well, that, I think that was discussed. Yeah, I understand, yeah, but I, I just want that down. And the other is, I, uh, I, I from the conservation okay. officer. They would like data, possibly, uh, uh, where we did telecheck. There's no fee involved. We're not talking about a fee, but a harvest log. So they know the difference between who's actually doing these huntings and who may just be using this as an excuse to spotlight. So they're, they're asking for telecheck information and data information because somebody could be spotlighted and say, oh, we're just out here. Uh, and that I got that from our conservation officers to take a look at. Can't just for the month of March. That's what we're looking at in discussion, right? Yes. And and collect that data from the month of March to see how well this is doing, and then also as they said it would help them on the enforcement end of it. Actually, we didn't vote on the month of March. The month of March was suggested. Right. I'm saying law enforcement safety right. because they were worried about right. looking for bait and turkeys and all right. I think we, just, we should take an early approach. We should eliminate April and have the rest of the year. You know, coyotes are a big problem in our area. Right. They take calves, they take people's dogs. Sure. And they, when they do that, they call the commissioner. Yeah. I understand. Would you still have it during deer season or just have it? Uh, 
In the summer months. Summer months only. Yeah, I'd, I don't know. I'd, I'd have to really, I mean, in truth, what is happening now is anytime anybody sees a coyote, they shoot them. And if you're a farmer and you can afford a uh, summer or night scope, you've already got one while you're up there shooting. And the point is people want to be able to sell more of their thermal imaging things and night scopes to take care of the stuff. Sure. But, but the prop, you know, we have too many coyotes. Yeah, I'm just giving you what came from my history show. Yeah, definitely looking into that. Okay, D, are you ready for D? Yes, sir. The, the other this item under that um, discussion item was the uh, uh, United Trappers and Tug had requested some extensions of the trapping season uh, through the end of March as well. And uh, we've had some more discussions with uh, with Chet and with the trappers as well as some discussions with the houndsmen. Um, so there are, there are some... Uh, some issues between the two different groups. We just like to have this between now and August, bring this back to August as far as kind of uh, more close to defining what we'd like to propose to the commission. So uh, I think we're very close. I think we've got some good options on the table. We just want to have time to talk to both groups and, and make sure everyone understands where we're moving. And the last, <coughs> any questions on that one? Okay. And the last uh, item was the discussion of the 2049, the small game fur bear hunting season to, to drought season. Um, as you all know, this was uh, talked about closing the drought season on public land on December 31st and closing the drought season on January 31st statewide. Uh, we have a Rough Draft Society um, meeting coming up here in a couple of weeks. Um, we'd like to talk to some folks there, some out-of-state folks and, um, and higher-up folks with the Rough Draft Society are going to be there as well, as well as do some surveys, um, some you know, web surveys and mail-out sur mail out surveys of grouse hunters, get some opinions on that as well and for you guys to have time, too, to talk to your constituents about um, what they think about that proposal as well. You might ask about tail-checking grouse as well, so we do know what uh, harvest numbers we have and we're at, just that, to give us some more information. That was brought up as well. In every club I went to, that was mentioned. Tail-check, tail-check. So we'll definitely bring, bring that up as well. I think we've got some, some other op options that we think might be as good or better, but we'll discuss all those. Sure. And that is... Do we need action for him to do that, or is no, we no, good? No. Okay. No. So the next action item is to amend 301 KR 2132, the elk hunting season permit zones and requirements, and uh, I believe there was an attachment with that. Basically, what we wildlife vision proposes is to keep the current 594 elk permits the same for the 2020-21 uh, season as we have for this upcoming season. Talked about that last time during the committee meeting. You know, there's a ne real need for consistency on the permit numbers for us to properly kind of analyze our elk populations and trends. Um, the next action item, we've got some research proposal to also help uh, tighten up our, uh, our our population model and help us give us more information on the elk, elk herd. Um, so, any questions on that? Make a motion to approve. To approve the current 594 elk permit. I'll second that motion. Okay, so we we have a motion um, by um, sorry, I'm, I'm thinking about what I'm getting ready to say. By Brian Fisher and seconded by Mr. Horn mm -hmm. to keep the current nine, uh, 594 elk permits the same for the 2020 and 2021 season. Is there any further discussion on that issue? That does not include the commissioner tag. No, we're, we're coming to that here in a few minutes. I does that it. include the commissioner tag? No. Um, this is just a regular season. I'll bring yeah, I've got them coming. Any I'm other discussion on that? I'm getting ready to find discuss. I spoke to uh, Gabe about uh, the number, the 594, when we were here the last time. Uh, he mentioned that it wouldn't be any issue to move it to 600. Uh, and I think in the interest of the hunting public, that to round it to 600 wouldn't be a, a difficult thing or a bad idea. Uh, but just want to throw that out. We have two individuals want to speak. Colonel Abel, we'll let you do, go first. Thank you, Dr. Plowner. Yes, um, uh, you know, we come to this microphone in committee meeting and in commission meeting. Sometimes we have a lot of angst amongst the sporting uh, public and the commission, and uh, I think it's only proper to uh, come to this microphone and also give opinions. Um, uh, both Gabe and Chris were very open about how that 594 number came about. Some, so were some of the
really just explaining why we're going to stick at 594 or, or okay. at 6, but stay at a very, very conservative number in the context of the study that uh, the gentleman from EPA and, and Gabe are doing was very, very well received. And, and I think it continues to speak to you if we can explain to the sports public. And, and of course, I'm only talking to a couple hundred folks in my organization, um, but they were upset that it's not backed up to 700, 900. And I said, right, let me explain it in the context. It's a conservative number. The board picked in the context of trying to get better herd numbers and eventually get to a true harvest objective number that's based on a solid herd number. They were very uh, accepting of the fact that the number's going to stay low until we get a better herd number. Um, so that's a kind of a thank you. Um, the other thing I would say is, um, uh, and it's not on the agenda, but I want to continually plug that if we have a residual number of lottery winners that do not actually buy and use their tags, that we should have a second or even a third tag drop. That would be a huge good news story for the department, in my opinion, and, uh, and would also we're also losing a little bit of revenue there. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Sir, and, and to that, uh, I would like to uh, put forth um, uh, a um, motion or proposal that in the next committee meeting, we explore and start on the process of using the tags that are not used um, and those in, uh, introducing them back into the system for a, a, a second draw or a reserve draw to utilize the tags that are that go unused. We had 10% last year, we about 90, 90 something tags that weren't used last year. I think we ought to try every way we can to develop a system to get those tags back to hunters and use. So Chris, will you note that and, and bring that up at the committee meeting his request? Yes, sir. To, to revisit that that thought also colonel the way i understand it about the 594 is the biologist wanted for us to try to be as consistent as we could in tag award uh for two or three years so they could get a better statistical analysis of of how the herd's doing if we start changing the figures a great deal it makes their statistical uh, look a lot more difficult. So I think one of the reasons they wanted to help maintain it at 594 was the consistency of the results of research. Yes. And, and that was easily explained to the folks sitting in my organization. Yes, sir. To both organizations that I'm a board member of. I, I will also say that those folks are like elephants. They remember when it was a thousand tags. Yes, sir. So it, it's the context is what really, really helps us explain it to our membership. Understood. Okay, I have a motion before the commission to keep the current 594 permits the same as was for 2002 uh, or 2020 to 2021 season. Uh, no further discussion. All in favor? I. No further discussion. So no, I just would go back to what Rob was saying about him. His discussion with Gabe. He said six isn't a big deal. Would make no difference. Not no, statistically I mean, it's, it's significant. Six is not. My question would be: Is where do you want those six? Just so to go that we way. We already got a motion, a Andy. One, a yeah. Six is a one percent change in yeah. the number, yeah. and a one percent change in the number is an unnecessary variable to the system. Okay. So okay. The motion okay. to second is at five ninety four. Yeah, the, uh, we're no. going to have to go back and, right. and you're going to have to withdraw right. that or, or amend that to be six hundred. If it, no, you, I didn't. No, I was for the discussion. Fine. I just wanted clarification. Right. Okay. So right. you have a motion. You, 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 second. Yeah, motion I have a motion second. for five ninety four. That's all and you second. Second. So for five ninety four. You need a vote. Uh, okay. okay. So all in favor of five ninety four? Aye. All against that? Nay. No nays. Unanimous. We'll adopt that motion. Okay. Uh, so, oh, I, wait, I did not allow, I did not allow Larry Richards to speak. I see it over here now. Is it too late for you to speak? Or do you want to add that to you because you want to speak on this other item? I want to speak no? on the other item that's fixing to come to you. Okay, can, do you want to hold that until then? Yes, sir. Okay, we'll just hold that then. I, and so does Colonel Label. So I will acknowledge that. Sorry that I left you out on that one. Uh, Okay. <laughs> well, uh, go ahead, Chris. All right. The last action item is the State Fish and Wildlife Research Proposal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can go through these individually, and vote on them individually, or all together, however you prefer. We individually. As, as we, were, we have reviewed these already, and uh, I vote that we, uh, I move that we 
cloud all of them as a package. And, uh, there's an issue with number one okay. that was brought up before the commission and we voted on it in the past. Uh, there's something that needs to be clarified in the budget. I, I think we did vote on in the budget that, that we would fund so many dollars per year for a three year period during the budget process. I worry that $100 total for three years is only $16 per six zones. And I think that's why we actually in the budget uh, package asked for $100 per year. So that's a discussion item that needs to take place to make those two consistent. So that's item number one you're talking about? Yes, sir. Yeah, we could sell those extra, we could offer those tags on with the proceeds to go to buy more cars. And, and I just want the research project to be consistent with the budget that we approved. I'm just trying to make sure. And I'm going to you know, be one so of the members of the budget. I just want to make sure I'm consistent. About this? You, you were about to get at? No, I mean, I'm just trying to see what, what you're discussing. I didn't hear that. You're saying you want to increase the number? On what, the what I'm saying is that dollars? during the budget mm -hmm. approval process, right. Last year, we approved a budget to put a hundred dollars per year into the Elton Zone. So at the end of three years, that would have been three hundred dollars. I worry that this research project in item number one only talks about a hundred dollars over a three-year period. That's only sixteen dollars per zone over the six zones. I don't think that's consistent with the budget that was approved last year. That's just a I, question. I can only speak to the, the money that was in my budget last year for college was enough for to get us to that hundred number. I've not seen the budget for 2020, but I don't think there's money in it um, for an additional hundred dollars. And I guess we'd have to go back to the minutes or talk to the commission members that were here when we approved that budget. But I do remember it was a hundred per year for three years, or that's my recollection. I remember we had that discussion. Mm -hmm. I know for us statistically and 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 also going back to the model that Dr. Millsball put together, a hundred maintaining a hundred was the number we needed to strive to do. Anything above that would be unnecessary for the resource, I mean for the money. So, you know, our goal and request is to maintain a hundred. If you want us to deploy a hundred each additional year for these, on top of that, that's that's gonna drive that number much higher for this project. So you you can get accurate results with that number. Absolutely, Six, sixteen per zone. You can get accurate. Yeah. And that's that's maintaining that number. Um, so if we have an annual die, we'll take that collar and put out more. So more than likely, we're going to have more than a hundred on the last day going into the hunting season this year. I just don't want to have a conflict with what was approved in the budget versus the research project. Yeah. This is maintaining one hundred a year. On yes. The Sure. Right. We're not I sure. Just have my recall that it was 100 my per year. This was last year. This yeah. was 100 per year. I don't recall. Well, well, I, I, I believe but, that's but, correct. But, but I, I don't was know. sitting beside of him when he discussed it. So you see what you're saying. I think that's what he said. I'm impressed. Can we can we hold this and run out and find out quickly yeah. and then come back to this? Yeah, we can do these other two separate if you want. Okay. I move that we approve the uh, Eastern Hell Danger Survey and the public shooting in the study. How are the Eastern Hell Danger in the matter of I'm second. Motion and second. Well, I see no, no further discussion on that. I second. Second. So we've got a motion from Dr. Carlos, seconded by, by Commissioner Swallows. Uh, no more discussion here, but I have two that we want to address. But you all want to address the elk. You don't want to care about the hellbenders and the survey of public shooting ranges. Oh, we do, but we think you're spot on on those two. So. Okay, so we'll so we'll hold off on your all's comments until we get this other. Okay, so all in favor of those two am amendments? Uh, uh, second or <laughs> not in favor or opposed? No. Motion carries. Now, we're, we'll wait a minute here to get this other. While, while we're killing time, uh, of course, 
studies that we need to do, the things that we need to consider. Uh, recently, the Burmese python has been found to carry a uh, parasite that infects pygmy rattlesnakes, which are an endangered species in the land between the lakes in that district. And I would like our reptile people to check the feasibility of banning the importation of Burmese python into the state of Kentucky. Okay, Dr. Bannon, and Sonny Carr is here. She couldn't hear quite well. But he was talking, Sonny, about Burmese pythons and uh, impacts for our pygmy rattlesnakes um, on some studies that he's recently read. And that's something that they're looking at a lot, not just for that, but for during with the pet trade and amphibians and reptiles, and there are lots of diseases and also parasites and stuff that are associated with that. So that is something that our program has been looking at as well. Yeah. We kind of need to stay in and kind of get a mix of, of individuals and, and other places and whatnot to explore, but I don't think it's very shocking to look at what's going on there. There's lots of good information about that. And uh, you know, so we should have some discussion on pet shows and things that they can and Mr. Chairman, I think with item number one, we have to look at what the project would entail at the different level of collars per year, what the project cost would be as it was presented at the last meeting. And, and, and wouldn't we also have to examine the budget, the upcoming budget, to see if that money could be re-budgeted over that? Because if Lisa's working on that budget now, yeah, there's no problem. Okay, so we've got three or four different things to look at. How much are we talking about, Mr. Chairman? What What did you tell me a collar? Where did he go? What he don't, check on that What does a collar cost? The, the, the better quality one's pretty high. The, the, yeah, we don't the, ones we, the ones we determined from the flow check on that were a little under a thousand, but uh, the stuff we researched probably was just yeah, a little higher than that. Now, that's the cheaper one? Yeah, is a thousand? Yeah, yeah. And there were so many colors that, that was supposed to be. It is an answer. Did it scare you real bad? You, you that's what a dog collar cost. There were so many colors that were supposed to be uh, provided by Rocky Mountain Elk, provided by. Uh, Appalachian viewing, so there were several sources of the college coming to you. Mr. Richards, do you want to go ahead and address the commission now about this elk situation or uh, about, you, you, you're down here for the three year elk survey that you want to address? No, I'll, 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 I'll hold my comment. Uh, I'm in favor of the three year elk survey. I think we go, we can't go forward without it. Uh -huh. uh, but I particularly like to speak to the issue of permits. Okay. I don't even think we had to sign up for that one. Don't don't let me forget. And and, and Colonel, is yours the same comment? Okay. I, don't y'all let me forget. Throw your hand up or throw something at me. Just a reminder to the audience yeah. also, please use the microphone because we do, as a matter of public record, if uh, audio recorded these, it sometimes it's hard to hear from the audience, the transcribers. So we're we're waiting on Dave for a few minutes. Can we can we Okay, with everybody, if we skip to new business for a minute, because I, I don't think we have any big new business, but we have some business kind of like we just discussed a few minutes ago. The new business is to include on the next committee meetings a few items. So is there new business to be discussed? Let's go ahead and jump ahead to that. Just stay where you are, Chris. Yes, sir. Yeah, you got to do the number three item here? The survey of public... I think they did two and three they, together. Yeah, we did two and three together. We, we already did that. So let's go ahead and discuss briefly. Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay, so let's hear from Gabe, and then we'll discuss new business when we get to new business. But we don't have money in the budget for the upcoming year for college. What, other, what, uh, what money we would have had, we built it into this contract. So you know, we had money for 100 GPS collars in last year's budget. Um, we will, in this contract, all of those collars will be purchased through the UK, um, and we'll maintain it at that money level. I spoke with them about it for the wildlife division. I spoke to Lisa. That money is not allocated for additional collars on top of this research project. So this coming year, that's 20 collars? This coming? Yes. The, the things that you all want aren't mutually exclusive. You could 
we could approve this study with one hundred callers. We could tag the one hundred callers that we're going to use in the study beforehand, and we could put out additional callers and continue to do the study as contractors Absolutely. if we could right. get the money for additional right. callers. So those things aren't mutually exclusive. I like that motion. Okay. I want to make a motion. I move that we go forward with the three-year. Uh, I'm going to have two motions. I move that we uh, go forward with the three-year health survey as previously presented in conjunction with the emergency plan. Okay. Uh, is that you're ending that motion, or you're also going to make that? That's okay. the end of that motion. And, then, and Paul, did you? Then I'm, I'm going to make another motion. Well, we've got to. Uh, we've got to take care of this one. I'll, I'll second his motion. You're going to second that motion. Any further discussion on that? We're okay with under with the understanding of that one. All in favor, aye. Uh, Opposed, no. Okay. Now, before we continue with new business here, go ahead. Okay. The second motion is that uh, since it's not mutually exclusive to have more callers, and since that the board uh, commission previously uh, requested 100 callers per year, that all efforts be made to make it 100 callers a year. We're applicable. I'm getting them through donations or uh, Appalachian Viewing Area, Rocky Mountain Foundation, and then supplementing where the budget will allow. Okay. Thanks, Ray. For totality of three, three years. years. So we're going to starting this year, so it would have to be in 2021 we would add in another 100. So we'll be capturing um, and getting to the 100 level in January of 20. Yes. So those will be on the landscape, and then we do up to 100 and an additional 100 in 2020. Yes. And that doesn't skew what we're no, going to no, count. No, no, no. Okay. What it is for this year. Oh, oh, okay. Can you repeat? I, yeah. Number one. No. 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 Number one's no, already. I understand, but I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> that's a, that's a <laughs> I'm sure. sure. I'm sure. sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. The, the this is an experiment eight. design with the University of Kentucky, with, and the, the deal is already done, and the, we're, we're going to do that every year. But that doesn't prevent us from putting more callers that aren't used in this particular And that's just number two. Okay, we yeah. Will, we, we'll, we'll try to put 100 Commissioner callers Carlos, would you two. mind, for the sake of the commission to hear it in its clarity, repeat your second proposal, your second motion? To summarize my second motion is that uh, we previously voted to put 100 callers a year in. So these three-year health study is 100, but not 100 a year. So that leaves a deficit of uh, 84 callers per year per, per zone. Or, so anyway, it's a deficit of uh, uh, co. We're going to try to make up that deficit, and it won't be part of the research program we're trying to accomplish the objective of the board by putting a hundred dollars out a year for three years so we can get an accurate count on that so we can determine how many we should be killing how many we should not excluding outside funding that's what you said yeah right? i don't care where we get the right. other callers yeah. i'd like to get a hundred dollars a year sure i don't care if we auction off the unused tags and use that money to buy callers and just keep in mind that the cost is not just the callers the cost is also in Capturing the yes. health, getting the callers on, tracking yes. the health. So there's there are other costs there. That was there a second to that motion? I'll make a second to that motion. So we have a motion from Dr. Carlos and a second from 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 Mr. Horn. Any other discussion on that? And everybody understands what the motion is. He does not need to reread that, and I do not need to go through that. All in favor, aye. aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. Okay. New business. Thank you, Chris. You're, are, you're not leaving, are you? Not, you're going to hang around. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, don't you leave me because I, I want to leave you in a few minutes. That's good. Uh, okay, new business, gentlemen. You all wanted to bring up a few things really as new business, not in voting wise, but to be sure that we have it on the schedule for next committee meeting. Yeah. Who, who's first? Take I jumped the gun okay. previously, so Go ahead. Mine, mine is that we look at yes. um, re entering. Uh, all unused elk tags back yes. into the system 
right. in some form or fashion. Or at least so get an explanation those. as to how we're doing it yeah. and how we can and, potentially and, and do, we do work, better at we work utilizing hard. our tags. And just to clarify what he's saying, right now you can buy your elk permit up to the night of the hunt or even you know into the hunt. Right. So we'll have to set a deadline in which you buy that so we know who's not going to have one. Right. So just some things to be thinking about when mm -hmm. that day needs to be. So that will yes. be brought forward to right. the next wildlife committee meeting that is, that to discuss that. That, that is Good. correct. Okay, Commissioner Fisher, you had a comment. Yeah, I'd like to propose in the, on the committee meeting agenda for wildlife next time they're going to discuss the creation of a deer working group uh, yes. with a concentration on chronic wasting disease. Did everybody hear that? Are you all, all able to hear that? Commissioner Fisher wants to next time explore having another deer working group. If you remember, we had one a few years back, having another deer working group made up of biologists, made up of a few commissioners, made up of concerned sportsmen that we look into and speci specifically examine CWD and the plan for CWD, both prevention-wise and in uh, and, uh, and education and, and education to the public. Okay. So that goes down on the record as, as desired for the next committee meeting also. Any other new business? Like an update at the next committee meeting on our uh, grouse initiative <coughs> on the uh, 49 elk that went to Wisconsin, an update on any discussions with Virginia, West Virginia, on uh, the monies from those 49 elk being used to uh, put grouse into the state of Kentucky. So I heard somebody out there with the grouse excited about that. Okay. Any other new business? Or the creation of the habitat? No. No. The habitat's already supposed to be happening. This is the money that came from the last 49 elk. Probably add in and get a habitat update to the commissioners. And then get a habitat update as well. Did you get that? Yes. Habitat update. Okay, if there's no further business, we're going to move on to the special commission permits, what everybody has been waiting to, to, to talk about. I, I think it would be prudent to, to really consider dividing this up into three different issues. And uh, I, I'm willing to be flexible with this with everybody for the sake of conversation. But we, we need to have a discussion, a discussion here of the commissioners on on uh, how many tags for each of the species, deer, waterfowl, turkey, and elk, uh, and then decide about voting for those, and then uh, talk about change, because there's some things that, that we want to address about change. Are you, yes, discussion, yes. So uh, the floor is open to the discussion of the number of tags we're going to distribute for those four species. And for the sake of the audience, uh, remember now that we're talking about for, for deer and for waterfowl, those will be effective this year. And for turkey and elk, it will be effective for next year. Everybody understands that for those four species, that that's what we're talking about. Everybody's good with that? When we, when we decide today on those four species tag numbers, that's what we're going to deal with first, the numbers on the tags. Not who gets, but the numbers of the tags. The deer and the waterfowl are determined for this season, this fall. Up. The turkey and the elk will be determined for next year, next it. fall. So everybody's no clear with that? It, it, it's it's kind of confusing since we have two different variables there that everybody's not quite sure which one's which, but that, that's how we'll do with, deal with that. So we, we, we need either motions or discussion on and taking these four species and determining the number of tags. That's the first order of business. Can, can I ask? How many people requested deer, turkey, and waterfowl? 18, Paul, I 18, I 18 elk, 14 deer, 13 turkey, and 12 waterfowl. You want to repeat that again, Paul? 18 applicants requested elk tags, 14 applicants requested deer tags, 13 applicants requested turkey tags, and 12 applicants for waterfowl. Everybody in the audience hear that number if, if they're interested in that. That's a, that's a good query. Okay. I'll give it to you. Evan. 18 elk, 14 deer, 13 turkey, 12 waterfowl. Okay, do we want to take these separately? Remember, we can give no more than 10. Just, just to go over for, for the sake of clarity, you can award up to 10, 
less than 10 or zero, that, that's up to the commission. Now, uh, you can discuss that or we can go on to each of these separately or we can do them all together if somebody makes a motion about that. So we got deer turkey, uh, waterfowl, and elk. I'll recognize who all on the floor wants to speak. <coughs> well, that's pretty sound. Mr. Chairman, for the sake of simplicity, I move that all these levels of each of these four permits be set at 10 each. Second. Okay, so that's, that's going to be 10 deer, 10 turkey, 10 waterfowl, and 10 elk. Do I hear a second? Do I hear a second for that motion? A second. That was your motion. That's your motion. That's correct. Okay. So, uh, Commissioner Knott made the motion. Uh, Dr. Carlos has seconded that motion. Now, discussion. Discussion on setting for deer, turkey, and waterfowl, as well as elk, 10 tags. You have six zones that allow hunting through the, the next year when these tags are going to be presented. So you're going to have to decide how you're going to distribute 10 tags among six zones. How are we going to decide which applicant gets it for each zone and then which zones have multiple? Did everybody understand that that concern? We are we are prepared to draw those uh, one, two, two, two through seven because zone one is not a hunting unit. Once those, if you go more than six, then we'll start over. And those that would be left over, then they can draw zones two through seven. So you don't put three people in one zone, for example. Do you understand that concept? So if we had 10 tags, we would draw six tags for the first time for six zones. Do we then take all of those six numbers, put them back into half, redraw those times four? So there'll be two tags remaining in there that would, would, not, would not be drawn out, right? Of the six, because you'd have 12 times two. And then you've got 10, so you're going to have two that wouldn't be pulled out. Are you with that? No. Okay. So the first time out, you're going to have all six zones drawn. Right, so then you're going to take 10. those same tickets, put them back in there, and you're going to draw four out to go. There'll be two people in four zones. The other two just stay in there. We're, we're not, you're only going to pull There'll out. There'll be unused zones, not unused people. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Everybody understand that concept? Any comment from the audience on that concept? And I'll give everybody two minutes. I'll, I'll give somebody two minutes. Oh, okay, Mr. Richards. Now, is this your two minutes no, sir. for this issue? This so, is so you're trying to get me two more minutes. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, I may get three. Uh, okay. Well, careful. <laughs> We're getting near the end here. So, yes, sir. I, and it's 11:04. I applaud everybody for watching, uh, doing this is with brevity. So go ahead, the sir. Drawn historically for your value commission permits has been any zone, any weapon, any season. Now you're proposing. Give the sportsman of the state a comment period there. The optics, the at large thing, excuse me. The optics here are going are to be something for us to overcome with the rest of the sportsmen of the state. I would, I would urge that when you, that's too many tags. Quite frankly, 10 L tags is too many. If you want to get that number to five or six, then you can stay with the existing program. Uh, it's up to you guys. But let's not pick a fight when we don't have to. Gabe, could you chime in to the the historical part of what ha happened with the zones? We voted on that last year. Right. So essentially when we changed the zones, the, um, the six zones, the, the intent was to uh, put the commission tags in. Historically, that's been the commission tags could have gone anywhere in the entire elk unit. Um, there was concerns where all 10 would go to one property and it would be too much pressure. So our, our desires were to limit their spread of those, of those tags. So our, our desires was that they would be placed into a, a unit um, that on the front end for the organization would be like a, a, a big bull or a hunt. Let me make sure. So that's not been discussed with anybody. That, that was made and not discussed anywhere. That, that's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Gabe, but that season hadn't happened yet. That's this year. That's, the, that's for 2019. That hunt hasn't occurred. No, but, but this was 
voted on and approved in 2018. Right, but in 2019 permits, it hasn't been. That, that, so that, was, that was to, to go forward for all cell towers. So that was in those, but those permits, were those permits let under, here's your zone one permit, here's your zone two permit, here's your zone three permit? Or did those people draw an elk commission permit thinking that they had an at-large permit? The folks that are hunting in a couple months are not restricted to those two units. It's moving forward. So this so is, now the, first, now this is the first season so where this would apply. That's what I was trying to clarify. What we're supposed to do is to, is to shift that into a, and, and the people that have applied for this year, I think they're applying for an at-large an at large permit because nowhere in this paperwork does it say that. There's, there's not an at-large designation. Well, not anymore. But I'm using the term, the general term, any, any area, any, any seat, and any, any weapon. Typically, is how that's been. Am I not right? That's that's how they have been in, until this point. Okay, but so now going soon, forward, going know. forward, we're changing the rules on them. Even though we decided to change them last year, the sporting public hasn't gotten that word. I promise you. Did any of those that applied understand that that it was not an at-large? It's not in the paperwork. Is it anybody that's applied that doesn't want an elk tag if we limit what those people can go to, that'll make my voting easier. Because I'm about ready to vote not to give an elk tag. It would, it would certainly decrease from the value of the tag. That's, on that's on an auction or a raffle basis, it takes away from the value of that tag. There are places right now that commission elk permits are not able to go. The intent was that by limiting the pressure of these commission permits to the units calling, they could go anywhere in that So it would open up opportunities that they know that they currently do not have. Five, I'm just throwing this out, five tags over the six elk zones, is that measurable pressure given the entire length of the season, be it archery, gun, muzzleloader, whatever? Is that even a quantifiable number? Spread yeah. across the entire elk zone, no, but on the ones that were properly substantial. I guess that's your answer. <coughs> Carl? Uh, Colonel Abel, uh, or Mr. County, or Elk County. Um, I understand the reluctance and the angst associated with this, Dr. Carlos. I would, and I wouldn't advise, I wouldn't presume to advise this, this recluse buddy of people what to do, but I would recommend, I would proffer to you not to do a zero number. Because if for anything, your foundation is, is part and parcel to the department, and that tag goes for a significant number, of, uh, significant amount to the foundation, and that's what we're putting thousands of kids who are paying a lot of money to put kids through conservation camps. So a zero number would be a bad thing. I think in discussions with one of the conservation organizations that I'm a member of that Larry was president of, which is Safari Club, the question of the zones becomes, is there an inequity in issuing a zone commissioner tag. And I understand what you're saying, Doc, that they're still gonna take it, but would we have a zone that is a better hunt? I mean, there's always zones, when I hunt out west, there's zones that everybody applies for because that's where they're at. The question that came up in our discussion, Dave, is does it, does a commissioner's tag per zone establish one tag then is better than the other? And if so, do we, how do we Further discussion among the, the, the commission? So at this point, we have a, a, a motion and a second for 10 tags across the board. Understand where we stand, everybody? Yep. Those in favor of, of that motion, clarify by saying aye. Aye. 
Aye. Opposed, no. 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 I need a show of hands on the no's. I have one, two, three, four no's, and I have one, two, three, four yeses. So, we're at the tiebreaker. Can, can we consider approving the 10 for these other three and discussing further that? Or are we going to we gonna go with uh, 10 for 10? And understand how we're going to do this. We're going to have to draw, we're going to have to draw six, then four after that. You're assuming that the number is, that was going to, go ahead. At, with a 594 remaining. Any other comments? Um, I, I had never, I had never even con considered this uh, this issue in this way about it going to Pacific Zones, but if you go from six or ten, either one, you're still doing the same thing, are you not? You're going to assign, you're gonna assign that tag to a zone. All right, so you only have six that that unless are. unless you do a number of tags less than, then they could go across the whole state. I think what everyone's concerned is you can't have 10 tags go to one specific property in one zone and wipe out the herd in that one area. But you can't have but six if, do it but, either. But, you, but if you had just, I'm just not throwing out a number, just uh, just, hard, just discussion purposes. If, right. you, if you had two, then two could go across the entire six zones. Three. But at 10, I don't think you can have 10 go to one zone. I, I would agree, but I would say you've got the same prob problem problem with six. And divide, but not nearly, it's not, not as deep. Um, well, it's a 40% reduced, but yeah, that's, words, that's it's the same problem. That's 40%, and also with the fact that this is not in any tag, uh, uh, this tag is changed. I don't think we, we as a, as a commission can go forward with this without, without, uh, with making these tags zone specific um, to the hunt. So if it's six, if we back this up to six proposals, are we still doing it by zone? I would, I would propose that we have to still be done by zone. We, I think that we voted on That's that. That's what we voted oh, on. Oh, oh, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna abstain from voting. So I, I will not break the tie. I think I need to reintroduce this as a discussion item right now. In other words, we need to, I, I'd rather have a better consensus than, than the chairman break a tie. In other words, I'd rather have you gentlemen, and I'm not copping out, but I, I think we need a better consensus because the public deserves to know a little bit better of, that we're, we're unified on this and it, it didn't take a chairman to break the vote. Is so I, I will abstain from my vote in order to discuss this a little further. Question for you, is the number of deer, turkey, and waterfowl limited to 10? Is it limited? That's the maximum you can do. Yes. For those three. Okay. For those three. That's so I'd, the maximum. Make, I'd make a motion that we have 10 deer, 10 turkey, and 10 okay. waterfowl. Okay. okay. So okay. so we'll come back and visit elk in a minute. So I have a motion that we, on the other three we accept Second. 10 and seconded by Dr. Carlos. All in favor of that, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Now, let's go back to, let's go back to this elk. Go ahead. Because no. I'm not satisfied as the chairman that we, we will give a public view of a consensus of the commission by four and four. They're gonna say it was a toss up and some guy just flipped the coin and had to make that decision. We, we never need a better consensus about whether we go with <coughs> 10 tags, four tags, uh, two tags. I think no tags is probably not a very good option at all, but that's my personal opinion, not a voting opinion. But we've got to come to a better consensus for the sake of the public and for the sake of the sportsmen than to, to have a tie-breaking vote. Does everybody agree with that? Or do you think I'm copping Mr. out on Mr. Chairman? It? Yes, sir. The thing I need clarification on mm -hmm. is one thing. Just to make it simple, that's why I put out the 10 number, and I can retract from that very easily. My question is, mm -hmm. when you go to six tags, are they zone-specific anyway? Yeah. Or are, yeah. And if they are, yeah. there is no difference in six and ten. You've only got two in one instead of one. But if if you're going to the six being at large, as the way the gentleman explained that, then that's a totally different thing. 
How did we have the last year? Were they at large or were they? This year is the year that they're going this, to be hunting. This is the first year. The but the, 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 public, the, the public exposure to that has been some this months. Time, not this year. Did we tell them at that time? Did we divide it into six zones? No, and sir. And then at that time announced that a tag per zone? No, sir. Last year. Four, last so year, it is new. Last year, year we four, select, last year we selected six, uh, seven tags for the 2019 season. And those seven tags can go wherever they have permission from the landowner to hunt. To hunt. They can't go hunt on property they don't have permission to hunt on. Okay. So here's, here's my question about this, and here's the reasoning. How come, I mean, is it, this is new information that these tags to the public that, w that we're going to award at this point are zone specific. They don't know that at this point? I'm asking. We, we, got, we don't know what the public knows. No, no, no. What, where was it? Where was it announced? We had it at last year's meeting. The, was, it was it announced to the public at that time? It was talked at work groups. It was talked at different meetings at this table. Zone specific? Yes. Do do the people that applied know that it's zone specific? Zone. It's random, how was it last year? A random draw? There, there is do no the organizations that no apply know that it's They got the tags specific. before the zones came out. Okay. Dr. Okay. Carlos, okay. That's, that's where I'm trying to find out. That's okay. what I'm trying to find I, out. I think the answer then, it seems like, is no. They did not know. Okay, Dr. Carlos. Point of order. Hang on. I've, I've been recognized twice by the chair and not been able to say a word. Okay. And so you have now, the floor. Now I would like to be able to say a word. Okay. Okay. There, I don't like the whole process of the way that we award elk tags. I don't like the law because the law is contradictory. Order. I, uh, the application form, uh, what you have to do for it is ambiguous, and each year we get it interpreted by a competent attorney to tell us which ones are eligible to vote on, and each year, somebody says somebody's not eligible. It's because there's a difference of opinion in attorneys, not that anybody's wrong or that anybody's bad. And we are coming it's, to that discussion it's in a, minutes. It's a, it's a difference of opinion, uh, and it causes confusion among the public. Now, this tag that we are giving is for 2020. It's <clears throat> so we have lots of time to do this say we don't have to do this today. We can clean up this regulation so that it's clear to everybody what you have to do to apply for an elk tag and who is eligible. And we can ask the legislature to do that for us. When, when that's done, then we can determine how many of these tags we're gonna give and we can make sure that everybody knows that from now on the tags are gonna be zone specific to protect the resource, and the tags are gonna be determined by lottery, which is fair, and so everybody will know what's going on, and everybody will be on the same page. The application process will be the same. The application will either be black or white. It will not be gray and subject to interpretation. So I would propose that, and this is not a motion, I would propose for discussion that we just delay doing the elk tag until the process is cleaned up is everyone satisfied? Just discussion point. Would the people that applied be the only ones that be that would be eligible, or do we open up the process to everyone again? I, I think that if the legislature changes the rules, we can open up the process for applications again, and uh, because there'll be a new application form that will not require you to put your grandparents' whereabouts on July fourth of eighteen sixty. <laughs> and everybody can do the same application. It'll be fair, clear, and it'll eliminate all this confusion and controversy among all the people. Now, I have a comment, I, Mr. Chairman. I, 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 I will I'll hold Mr. that comment Chairman. just a minute. Let me ask the, the public and those of you who are guides, do you all, con do, do you all confirm yeah. what our attorney <coughs> and what the commission believes that the process of applying for these is is ambiguous, very difficult to understand, and too involved. Or does everybody say, it's okay with me, it, 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 it's okay. Do you all find it difficult or ambiguous because we're gonna to come to some, some points that the commission has made of ambiguities that exist in the process? Is there anyone here that even applied?
So if Ann Cummings said it's ambiguous or gets told that, yeah. then another two Yeah, can we do that? Any, everybody who thinks that the, it, the, this, this process of applying, I'm not talking about choosing, I'm talking about applying, is difficult, ambiguous, or, or too involved, or you think it's okay? Raise your hand if you think it's too involved. Okay, who, who, who thinks it's okay? Which one the, is the, it? The process is okay. Okay. Have, have you all read all the ambiguities like, like uh, Mr. Richard pointed out yesterday when I talked to him about we've got one date that it has to be in hand by and another one that has to be postmarked by? Okay. So most of you are not finding it difficult in, in this room. But believe me, we've got lots of complaints that it's extremely difficult. And, and now, now. No. Okay. No, hang on. I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the floor in a minute. Okay, go ahead. I've got a couple caveats here. In the first place, when we talk about 10 or 6 in the zones, uh, the discussion sounds like that's the only people that's going to be hunting. Uh, if, if, according to my math, you've got 594 other people out there hunting, and you've got 45 landowner tags, which makes 639 hunters. And to debate between 6 and 10 is... I, I can't do, I can't figure the math. Well, what difference could it possibly make? Well, the difference is one, uh, am I, I mean, Victor, huh? Atkin? Three, a difference of three and 639? I mean, <laughs> I don't see how that, that would make any difference at all. Uh, well, if you it, move it, it, then I don't think it'd make any difference if we had a thousand tags. Well, now you know the difference then, between three and a thousand. I, I mean, personally, I don't. But, I mean, <laughs> you're asking me. Uh, Mr. LaPointe? When we, do, when we do the harvest number, it doesn't add up. Well, you, you may step to the microphone. And, and the second thing is on, talking about scrapping this whole thing. It is, it's been my experience that what has got us here today, that we go forward with it, uh, decide how many we're going to do, draw them, and go on. Mm -hmm. If we change this or postpone it, you're only going to invite more criticism. It's going to cause more confusion, and it's going to put out a bad signal from this board. Mm -hmm. so I think we need to move forward today, pick these tags, and move on. Okay, well, the very reason that I abstain okay. is because we have to have a better consensus for the public view than forward versus forward. Sure. We, we've got to have that better consensus. Yes, sir. If you want to do ten at-large tags, let's do it. But six zone specific. That's where I'm at. Wait a minute. We've already voted. I know. Yeah, the zones are in. The zones are in. The zones are in. The question is, are you going to have? First, that's the first area where we've got a, an issue because the public doesn't understand at this point, uh, or the the people applying. <laughs> They're going to use them and going to get them. Don't understand that it's zone specific. Mr. Lapointe, I'd like to hear from you. Mr. Lapointe, I want to hear from you. Say, your, state your name and where you're from. Ross Lapointe, Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, as a 501c who has been a recipient of the elk tag uh, twice now, with every hunter put a hunter in, we are grateful for the opportunity and we rely on this money to run our program. Uh, was I aware that it was? No, but to be perfectly honest, beggars can't be choosers. I will deal with whatever the hand is drawn, and I'm okay with that. Uh, the, the, as far as the form, is it ambiguous? Is it hard to fill out? You're going right it is. That's why I have a long way to do it. Uh, there's a lot of questions on there that I think is redundant, and you got you all have that information. Why did you, why am I regurgitating it on the? We're going to address that. It's We're going to address that fact in a few minutes. But, uh, okay, Mr. Richard, thank you, sir. Mr. Richard, do you have anything else? It's to? not that the application process is difficult or hard to understand. It's the fact that the, the vetting of those applications is problematic. Uh, in 2017, the Floyd County uh, Fish and Game Club got one of your permits, and they were clearly a 501c7 organization, yet your lawyers vetted that. So that's a mistake in the process on your side, on the, on the Fish and Game Department side, that has to be corrected. The, the, the application process, I found most of the applications were, and I looked through the last five years, are, most of them are complete, uh, and the devil's in those details. Some of them should have never been reconsidered due to their follow-on reporting either not being accurate 
not even being there or being for a purpose totally different than what we envisioned these for. Thank you. We're going to address that here in just. Yeah, we are, we're, that we're going to we're going to express some of the concerns of the commission as well as the attorneys. When they've gone over this now, and about four of them have looked at it, they find many ambiguities and some problems with the application itself. And if we can streamline this process, we won't be having this debate if we streamline this thing. To make it more understandable, less ambiguity in the thing, and whether it's in your hand or in the mail on May the 1st, where people are saying, well, now you're disqualified because it was in the mail, but it was postmarked, but it says it's got to be in hand May 1st. So we do have some issues with that, and we're going to address that in a minute. We're, we're still, th this debate is still on the table without the number, about the number of health tags. Uh, Colonel, did you have anything else, or did anybody else want to say something from, uh, uh, okay, Don, you got your two minutes. State your name and. Donald Thomas from Crater Ridge, Kentucky, Health Act Association. Just want to try to clear some things up. I've listened to all sides right here. On your commission tag, you can do 10 at large. One of the problems is, just like they were saying, you can make one commission hunter or you can make 10 of them and put them in one area. That does go to work. Right. If you're going to be unit specific, then you do your six. Then you go back to the value of your tag. And when people apply for them, you are going to have different values of the tag. So how are you going to address that? As a lottery drawing to award the applicant a tag? Because that would be the only only way you could do it fair. Because each one of those tags will have a different value per unit. The 10, I, I don't know if I would look at that one. The six, if you're going to be unit specific, The at-large tag, if you believe them at-large like they are right now, with some of the numbers, you can have, or as we were saying earlier, you can have 30 hunters in one area, and then you've got 10 more commission hunters right there in that area. It's, I just wanted to take that out. No, but I'm sorry. Are you recommending then, instead of drawing at the very beginning and saying, okay, organization A, you got drawn unit three, organization B, you got unit four, you're saying draw the, like, these guys go ahead and distribute the tags and then draw whoever gets that commission tag, then draw a unit after it's similar to the rest of the hunters? Is that what you're saying? <coughs> you, would, you would kind of have to to do it fairly. You've got the applicants for the commission tag. If you're going to be unit specific with those commission tags, assign a seat there. It's going to decrease the value of your tag though with the 10 at large tag. I'm not sure with that, but if that's, that's the way we're going, assign six of those. And to be fair to the applicants of those tags, you would have to do some type of random drawing because each one of those tags would have a different value. There's a reason I don't pretend to say it. Uh, I like to have a point of order. I was under, had the understanding 600. that the so zone specific was voted on and settled. Is that not so? The, the, the zones are settled. So no yes. matter what the number is, they're the going to be in the zone. there. The zones have already been approved. Well, there you go. But yeah. Let me make just a, a yes. clarification. And, and this is just history. When the tags were reduced from 700 to the current number, that's when the commission tags were reduced, and it was reduced because the general public tags were being reduced. So the perception was we need to reduce the commission tags as well. That that was the only reason was that if the if the 700 was being reduced to 600, then the commission tags would re be reduced as well. That's how it happened in the past. One more time say this about it. We're talking about the 7 to the 10. We're locked into the fact that we're doing this by zone and not at large, are we not? We've never yes. voted for that. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I, that has been voted, has it? Not for the commission tag. Yeah, it, I have the minutes from, the, from yes. that meeting if you want me to read it. Please. I, I may be wrong. Um, it says, creating a system of elk hunting units and assigning each hunter a unit will help to distribute hunting pressure and allow better management of the elk harvest. The intention is to develop a secondary drawing to assign a unit and to allow people to apply for public hunting options in their unit. Now, it doesn't specify type of hunter, doesn't specify commission tag, general hunter, it just says each hunter, but the minutes don't break it down any further than that. But that, I believe that was the intention of the wildlife division at the time, and the program was for all of them. And again, as Gabe had mentioned, I think the purpose was with the commission tags, even though 
we tell the commission tax you can go wherever. Well, except you can't go into these areas that you have to be drawn into for special areas. This could actually help. You know, you're, you've got the entire unit now. You can go into any of the areas, whether it's a, uh, you know, a, de a designated area, not what you're calling them now, regulated area. So it opens up that opportunity. So you could see it one of both ways. While, yes, it's a, a, just a, a unit, but in that entire zone, I keep saying unit, in, that, in that entire zone, you can go anywhere in there. So you could look at it one of two ways. But those are the minutes from the meeting, if that helps. So in understanding that, the, a, a person, let's say you were drawn for an L tag. Mm -hmm. Now you have this tag. Now you are then drawn for a unit. Correct. Later. Yes. Okay. So if I buy a commission tag and I spend my money for it, then I'm drawn again later for a unit. Is correct. that correct? Or you guys were talking about doing it on the front end and assigning a unit on the front end to an organization. Organization A just got drawn for unit two, organization B, unit three, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. You could honestly do it one either way. That's why I was asking what um, the <coughs> But what we are not doing is saying these are at large. That is correct. Okay. Mr. Chairman, may I ask something? Did you, did you once Lori finished what you well, were saying? Well, what I'm saying is Hang then on. we are doing it by zone anyway. So, like he was pointing out in the math a while ago, whether you have it by zone and you have six, seven, or ten, it does statistically make very little difference to the hunting to the hunter that's out there. Who it does make a difference to is these three or four organizations that do not have their opportunity to raise their funds for their project this year that will be denied a tag, so probably maybe fifty thousand dollars or more that they will not get, and that's the intent of creating special commission tags is to promote and help these organizations moving forward in their projects and things for conservation and creating new hunters that they do with that money. So that's what you're really reducing. You're not really changing the hunting pressure or anything on the landscape by six or ten or whatever because you're still doing the same system either way. It's changing to being drawn again versus at large, either way, no matter how many you get. Uh, as, as a newbie, I'm, I'm ready to vote <clears throat> or I'm ready to clean it up. It doesn't matter which way y'all want to do it. First of all, I want to say Daniel and Steve, y'all have done one heck of a job. And I want to thank you for yes, exactly. what you have put together. I've, you I've have worked got that. <coughs> tirelessly. And I know that. I've spoken to you. I've met with you. Um, I'm not, a, I'm not against the cleanup. We're talking about the two attorneys two who have researched all this. Yeah, and uh, this has been phenomenal. Uh, I'm not against the cleanup, but i got to ask you this. May I ask the gallery? Yes. Uh, those of you who are applying, how many are here that are applying? Jimmy, I know you are two, uh, three, four. Would you, if we clean this up, is that a burden for you to reapply? I just I just need to know that personally. May I ask this? Yes. I'm asking.
Further discussion or any motion you want to be made by a commissioner? Oh, somebody's got a hand. Mr. Richards. I can't see you over Mr. Richards. Yes, sir. You, you run the risk of devaluing all the permits across the board because when, for instance, the Rocky Mountain Health Foundation goes to their annual convention with the Kentucky governor's tag, that's worth a lot of money. If the person buying that tag realizes he may not be successful in this unit draw, it's not worth near as much money. Devalue those tags across the board when you do that. Uh, and as I said, most of the sporting public that, that is not aware that this is going to be a unit specific draw. And the way I read the minute, or the way that Karen read those minutes, I kind of believe that you were talking in that discussion about the general elk permits, not about the commissioner's elk permits, because when you discuss those as a group, you always set that aside. You talk about commission elk permits general health permits and you never you never touch those in the same boards. That's that's just the optics. Thank you. Ms. And Ms. Richard, he's correct that there's not set those tags out for the record. Mm -hmm. the, the the discussion before the board is a number of tags between seven and ten. Yes. And we seem to be divided on it. Whoever made that motion might consider dropping it to nine and re-voting and see what happens. Compromise seems to move things We'll along. entertain any motion, but I, I was not going to break a tie that would show, give the public appearance that the commission is divided. Mr. Chairman? That bad. Yes, sir. I'm, I can go with six at large, but I don't know, from my understanding, that wasn't an option. Is that? That is still, well, it's, it's not, not clear that it's, it's it's not clear to me they, they that it's not an option. As I if, said, if, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to debate what it's happens. At this point, it is, I mean, am I understanding we, we right never, legally here that at this point it is not written in, so in minutes we attended, that so we it's never voted a on. designated zone <coughs> tag? It's not in there. It may have been implied, but it is not in there. It just says an elk hunting unit and a hunting unit. Now, do you want to, does Sunborn want to entertain a motion to first declare six zones that whatever tags are drawn, those will be used in those zones? Because if it's the intent, but not in written in print, it needs to be in print instead of uh, instead of saying, well, that's that was the intent. No, we've got to put it, if you all want it in zones, then somebody needs to make a motion that we declare six zones for the for the tags that the commission will assign. Then you can talk about how many you're going to put in those zones. But would, if it's not in there right now, if it's not in there, you either have to put it in there or it's going to be at large. As a point of clarification, because we did not address it when these people filled out their applications, I would suggest that the 2021 season be no different than the 2019 season, okay. which is setting the number of tags. Okay. Did everybody hear that? Would you want to make a motion to that, Paul? Do, do you want to make a motion or do you want that for, for discussion? Well, we, for got, we need to wait on one to come back. So I, we're, we'll have a okay, discussion okay. item right now. Did everybody understand what Commissioner Horn just I said? Sure I understand it. Leave it like 2019 until we can clean because up. Because the First people all, that turned in their applications I'm was be not talking, clear in the application process. I'm going to be talking here in just a few minutes about how we have got to. Clean. This is what happens. We've got to clean up this regulation. We've got to clean up the wording. The process, the whole thing has got to be cleaned up. And we're going to talk about how we're going to do that because we've already had four lawyers looking at how we can do this. And the commission has, has looked at the discrepancies and what's written and what's expected from the people. So I will tell you ahead of time, we are going to clean up this regulation well, come hell or high water. Now, uh, no. we, we first got to decide on this issue of where they're going to hunt and how many. Right. And then we're going to get to this other, this other thing. We're having a walk we're having another to walk out. These guys drinking too much water. Walk out, <laughs> <laughs> well, where they're going to hunt has a big bearing on how many tags that you have in the team. Well, I understand that we can't stack a bunch on there, but I also understand that we can't break news to them when they get out in the field. Oh, yeah, by the way, you can't get outside of this zone. And, well, we've got to make it crystal clear. You know, for that reason, public perception and what we're doing, that I, I'm in agreement that we keep it as is. At large, until until we get it clarified, until well, we've the got enough time. Had a chance to do it. Even if even if that's not decided, hang on, 
Hang on. Mr. I have Mr. I have the floor. Yeah, go ahead. I, I have the floor, gentlemen. Chairman, I'm sorry. Even if, even if we decide that, we've got to make it plainer on print. It, no, no matter. We've got to make it plain Because I am not going to break to the public news that they did not know as a, as a reg. Yeah. So if, if we do that, then that's, if that's the pleasure of the commission, then we'll do that. But we're not going to say, well, that was our intent, but it's not written down. No, I'm not going to do that. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, if we are have the ability to make, a, and these tags are going to be at large, I would like to withdraw my original motion. For the number. For the number. For the sake of being not overloading areas with four or five extra Absolutely, minutes. and never was. Right. As long as we were doing the, the zone specific, and the mm -hmm. one the gentleman spoke that how the price is reduced of those if you've got to then draw for a certain zone is very okay. correct. Okay. So I'd be happy to withdraw that motion if they're going to be at large tags. Okay. If that is an option. Okay. I'm waiting for one commissioner to get back, and I'm gonna I, I'm gonna ask for a motion when he gets back so he can hear. Chairman, may I make a comment? Yes, sir. Chairman pointed out, and this this might help you in terms of determining which way you want to go or vote. So she made the point that if if hunters are distributed by unit, uh, they they could hunt those regulated areas, which could be higher density or how more highly desirable areas to hunt. But if they're at large, presumably the same system would be in place as previously, which would mean they would not have access to those regulated areas. They would just have to get landowner's permission. Land but we do it we would do that until we clean this all same up. Same way it is. So it'd be the same way it was last year. Let me ask you, Gabe, do you have any problems with anything that we just <coughs> just talked about? Any of that scary? <laughs> tell me, the, tell me the truth. I, I, I want to hear the truth. We're we're as transparent as we can get here today, and and I want to know the truth. Uh, if last year was was, could you live with one more until we get this thing cleared up? I think it needs to be cleared up. Yes. Um, does it scare me? It depends on what's tracked mm -hmm. um, and how I would answer. Them. Well, tell me the scariest case scenario if for you. you. Yes. One spot. Yeah, we talked about um, that. So that, that but could you live with six at, at large, like it was last year? Seven. 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 Did that happen was last year? It's happening this year. We're not to it's that point. I can't speak to what happened because that seven is going to hunt in a few months. But, but and I will past. say that there are places that those seven cannot go right now, that they are not allowed to go. Mm -hmm. But with the system that we have in place that we propose by putting them by units, it would open up those places. Mm -hmm. So there are more opportunities I, by that. I, I'm in agreement, but I think the zone idea, this is my personal opinion, not the commission's opinion. I, I believe that the zone idea is a great idea, but I am against breaking it to the public the day before they walk out in the field. And, so. and we're not, because these, these organizations are getting these permits and they're selling them and they're not going to, to hunt for 18 months. 15, 13 months, I guess. So, but I, I guess the problem is, is when they applied, they didn't understand that. So, we need to make it perfectly clear. So, when they apply for the 2021 season, how this process will be. So, I would make the motion mm -hmm. to the chairman that 2020 season is no different than the 2019 season. We set a number of seven tags, and the seven tags are not zone specific, but they have to have landowner permission where they hunt. I second that. Okay, we have that motion from Paul. Seconded, seconded by Ken. Is there some discussion? And here it comes. Discussion. We have a wildlife biologist who has told us a year ago that we cannot put more people in the zones. We cannot have unlimited. We have to restrict it. We have a thing that says all hunters. All hunter means all hunters. So we've already done this once. Now we're doing it again. That's what I hate about this commission is we rehash everything and try to write, write every law over again. We are to protect this species. And the, our biologist tells us that what we have done in the past is not protecting the species. We need to protect the species. So I'm opposed to this amendment. We decided it once. It was, I, and I don't, no offense, Larry, but I don't need Larry to tell me what my intention was when it was my intention. My intention was all hunters when I voted for this. 
to, to protect the resource, I'm going to give advice and advice to have my life. Or <coughs> I want to say work out the wild hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on, on, the, <coughs> on the recommendation of the wildlife biologist, we voted for this, and, and we're rehashing it again. We need to clean up this regulation. We need to move forward with a clear path. Other comments? We have a motion before the board, or before the commission, before the commission, to hold the season exact, exactly as it was last year with seven at-large tags. We have that seconded. All in favor of that motion, signify by aye. 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 Opposed, no. Uh, no. We have one no, or two no's. We have two no's, motion carries. Okay. So there will be seven at-large tags. I'll down. I'd like to make another motion. Okay. For the 2021 20, season, we make sure on our applications, mm -hmm. we are specific and we are clear of how we're going to carry it out before they apply and before we get their applications back. And I'll second that. Does everybody understand the motion before the commission? You, you want to make a comment? Uh, yes, the uh, application has been adopted and, and incorporated into the regulation. It would require a regulation change to change the application. Just to make sure everybody's aware. So if we clean up this, if we clean up this regulation, it's got to go before legislative review. Is that what you're saying? But we would have time because we're talking about the 2021 yeah. season. Yeah, 2021 uh, season. Does everybody understand that motion? The motion from from Commissioner Horn is that we specify in the next group of applications for 2021 that this will be a zone specific hunt, so that the public will not be surprised uh, uh, months before the season. And I have that second. And all in favor of that motion signify by aye. Aye. Opposed, no. That motion carries. Okay. Are, are we, are we? I'd like to make a motion that we give the commissioner the authority to work on cleaning up the regulation and bringing it back to us and getting it implemented before the next time this arises. Okay. I second that. Okay. That's a little premature, but I, 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 I want everybody to understand. We're getting ready to talk here in a few minutes. The motion's a little premature, but I, we can entertain that now if you want. I, I want everybody in the audience to understand that we are going to clean up this regulation, and I'm going to tell you why from a commission aspect in a minute, and our attorney's going to tell you why from a legal aspect. But we can go ahead at this point and, and entertain that motion if you want to, to to promulgate the authority to start working on changing that to the commissioner and the attorneys now instead of waiting for this for another year. We can promulgate that authority to them now so they can start on it. And I, I think also that that's the thing to do, to clean up, this, clean up this regulation so we don't have misunderstandings, so we don't have people it, filling it out incompletely and then it doesn't come in here and, and we argue over whether they dotted an I across the T. So I have a motion that we promulgate that authority to the, to the commissioner and the attorneys. And then there may be four of them looking at it. We've had four looking at this thing already. I have that seconded. All in favor of that motion signify by aye. Aye. Opposed, no. That motion also carries. Now. I want to tell you all about the this. We, we now have a number, and before we go today, we're going to vote. That's coming up here in a few minutes. But we're going to clear up a few of these misunderstandings and help you all understand why we need to clean up this regulation. I will first start by telling you there is no power, there is no power for the commissioners in giving these tags. We have no outside influence. There is no conspiracy in any of this. There's no tossing of a coin. This is an extremely complex honor of the commission to give these tags out. So if anybody thinks that you we're gaining anything from this personally, uh, you're mistaken. So I, I want to clear up a couple of those things and, and I, I can start by showing you this. I'm, I want to show you what each of these commissioners got to evaluate for the applications. That's the stack they got. I spent six hours going over that stack. And Mr. Richard showed me over here. He went back several years and looked at it. But this is what I looked at at my kitchen table. I haven't met with the other commissioners to go over this. I did this at my own kitchen table. They have done it at their kitchen table. So I, I want to start by telling you that this process is taken seriously by this commission. I know all these men, they have, they have labored over looking at these applications. 
We have got to do something to make this more user friendly and more commission friendly to, to evaluate. They get great pride in awarding these to people because we, we're giving them to people who are conserving, who are helping our habitat, who are educating and teaching our children about conservation measures, about hunting and fishing. So we take pride in the fact that it's, it's a pleasure to give these out, but we also take this extremely seriously. So if anybody thinks that we're flipping a coin to decide who gets these, or if they think we're all getting together over a cold beer, they are mistaken. I have, not, I have not talked to any other commissioner about these. I have sat at my kitchen table, and I've talked to a couple who say, I have sat here for six hours. I think you told me been a day. six hours at the table looking these over. So we take this duty and honor quite seriously. That's how I want to start. I'm going to re read you a, a kind of a prepared statement, because if I don't, I will veer from that. After I'm finished, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Fields, our, our, one of our attorneys, and, and he and, and Mr. Shulman have done, as, as Commissioner Eaton has pointed out, have done a yeoman's job of trying to make this, this regulation a little clearer to understand and vetting by them. So uh, bear with me while I read this, and then I'm going to ask him to read this too. So everybody who doesn't know this process will get a better understanding today. Special permission, uh, commission permits for deer, turkey, elk, and waterfowl were proposed by the commission and approved by the legislature in 2001 to provide opportunities for incorporated nonprofit wildlife conservation organizations to raise funds through the sale of awarded permits and in turn use the proceeds to support uh, projects in <coughs> Kentucky. This regulation provides some broad qualifying criteria, broad qualifying criteria for the commission to use in evaluating applications. Among those criteria is the potential for enhancing Kentucky in one or more of these ways. Fish and wildlife, habitat, fish and wildlife education, and fish and wildlife related recreation in Kentucky. In discussing with senior department staff and legal staff, it has become apparent that there are provisions and language in the regulations that are either unclear, unnecessary, or impractical. And here are some of those examples. We need to clarify whether an, applica an application must be received by the department by the deadline or whether it may be postmarked by the date. There are two conflicting requirements in, in, those regulation, in that regulation. Past compliance is one criteria of award eligibility in the regulation, but details of such, such as time frame of the, or the nature of the compliance are not clearly specified in the regulation. The required reporting on use of proceeds and project status does not specify how to accommodate multi-year projects, because some of these are multi-year. More detailed and specific documentation and reporting is needed for recipients' expenditures, including whether projects' objectives were met and annual reporting if projects span multiple years. The regulation should stipulate that an organization is ineligible, not subject to ineligibility, but is ineligible for permits awarded until full reporting on prior awarded permits is complete. If you don't tell us how you spent your money, you're not eligible. And it's not subject to not eligible, you're not eligible. Now we've got this ambiguity of, well, it's according to how you want to look at it, they may or may not, have, we can make it that way. Clarification of tax exempt status documentation is required for qualifying conservation organizations. Of course, these and other improvements to the regulation would also necessitate review and improvement of the application and reporting forms that nonprofits would use to apply in the future. Today's review and selection process, as we've already talked, we could have gone 10 permits, anything less than 10, or award none. Uh, I, I, at this time, though, I. I've, I've asked the department's legal counsel, uh, Mr. Fields, is going to address us today, and they both have worked on this as well as two other attorneys, uh, to provide us with an overview of the applications received for consideration, uh, the process for which these have been reviewed, and the legal opinion about which organizations are eligible for consideration by the present regulation. Understand I said by the present regulation. Okay. Mr. Fields, the floor Thank is yours, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, some of this might be recapping what the chair has said. Um, I'll be 
going over some issues that became apparent while we were looking at the applications and the regulation, as well as how we embedded the applications as they came in. Um, first and foremost, all of the applications and the accompanying documents that, that were provided were received or postmarked by May 1st. Some were received after May 1st, but were postmarked by May 1st. Um, there is a discrepancy, as the chair stated, that um, in one part of the regulation, it says delivered by May 1st, but in the application, which has been incorporated into the regulation, which effectively is part of the regulation, it says postmarked by May 1st. Uh, <coughs> this discrepancy uh, obviously would cause confusion with everybody involved, so we have to do the most lenient of the two, so postmark by May 1st. Uh, going forward, that's something we need to uh, address in the reg. Um, and uh, once they were received, the primary considerations are whether or not the organization is a 501c3 charitable organization and whether or not they have a proper purpose in their articles of incorporation or bylaws. For the 501c3 status, each application included some form of written documentation which stated it was a 501c3 charitable organization which did include their EIN number which is the tax employee identification number. Um, the reg currently just says written proof. It doesn't specify what we want. We should clarify that and say exactly what we want. Um, these this status, some of the organizations were decades old, the letter wa wa was, and are still in force. Others are newer and had their, re their status revoked and reinstated. Normally, I would assume by a paperwork issue that happens all the time. Um, so what we did was go to the IRS database that was published by the feds and verify each and every one of these organizations had a current 501c3 status. So, but you're proposing that we check it each year. Each year it has to be a new one each year. Yeah, that's what um, they won't get a new determination letter. Each time an uh, organization is created, they'll get a, a determination letter from the IRS. If something happens that their status is revoked, they'll get a rev revocation, but then when they get it reinstated, they'll get a reinstatement letter. So what I'm gonna be proposing in, in the upcoming changes will be the most recent IRS determination letter of your 501c3 status. So we don't, right. in general, I'm still gonna look. Next year when it comes time, we're still gonna go check the IRS database and make sure it hasn't been revoked since the letter they got three months ago. Yeah. Because that's the most up-to-date information we can look at to make sure they are 501c3 status eligible. Um, I had uh, previously provided some summary sheets to you all um, on those sheets, there were three organizations that had a gray um, color to them, to the spell. Um, those organizations were all chapters of the National Wild Turkey Federation. They are all utilizing the same EIN number, which is their national organization group number, which is perfectly fine, but per the regulations, that means though any awards to those organizations need to be split amongst the organizations and can only get one of each type of tag. Um, so those were marked in, in those sheets for you to keep it easy and they're going to be marked on the ballot as well. There were two chapters of the Rough Grouse Society that did apply. However, they did so under two separate EIN numbers and so therefore they would be eligible independent of each other. Um, regarding the documentation, the regulations govern governs the Special Commission Permit through 301 KAR Chapter 3 100 um, Section 2 Subsection 8 directs the Commission to review and consider all applications and documents submitted for each organization that has not been disqualified pursuant to Section 2 Subsection 5. Um, so section 2 Subsection 5 is disqualification based upon their EIN status and just their documents showing that they are a wildlife conservation. That, in the regulation, is the actual grounds to not provide the application to this commission. Uh, everything else has to come to you all. Um, there are grounds 
for disqualification. If the commission chooses to do disqualify someone, those are under section two sub seven. The language states the following shall be grounds for disqualification from the awards process. It's important to note that the regulation doesn't state the applicants shall be disqualified. Uh, the grounds listed are a list of reasons for which the commission could disqualify an application, but any disqualification would be under your discretion to those grounds. Um, and, it's and somewhat that, redundant. Let me, I hate to interrupt you, but is that under individual discretion? In other words, as a commissioner votes, can he decide in his own mind whether that person should be disqualified for an, for something being a little improper or not quite in, in order, and another vote against that because he thinks it it does disqualify him, or does it have to be as a group? Um, it does not stay as silent to that. Um, it, as I was about to say, it is somewhat redundant in that you're reviewing the applications to decide who you think should be entitled to a, to a permit and voting on those. So at, effectively, you could just not vote for them if you think they should be disqualified. On an individual on basis. On an individual basis. Or but if not you wanted, eliminated as a group. Or as a group, if you wanted to, you could, you could do that. This is the very reason, I'm interrupting him, and excuse me, Counselor, but this is the very reason we've got to clean this thing up. It, 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 there's too much, I, I interpret it this way, I interpret it this way. Okay, I'll go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, you're fine. <coughs> um, the grounds that we were discussing are an incomplete application, um, incomplete or missing documents required under Section 2, Sub 5, which, once again, somewhat redundant in that you all are not to receive any applications that were disqualified under Section 2, Sub 5. So that one really shouldn't happen. <laughs> um, the failure of the organization to use or transfer a permit awarded in the previous year, and a failure to submit the application and the accompanying documents by May, the May 1st deadline. As we addressed earlier, the May 1st deadline is somewhat ambiguous, but um, using the postmark date, which was the most lenient date in the reg, everybody should comply with that. Um, I got a little off track and skipped forward on what I had to talk about. I apologize. Um, and in reviewing the applications, uh, the we the Prepared the documents that you received previous, I think, a couple of weeks ago, um, showing you our summary of the status. Um, under Section 29, we are to advise the Commission on various aspects of them, and those would be included in the, the documents you previously received. Um, some of the applications had some minor issues um, on the application form. We detailed those in the documents you received, they're on here. Um, historically, the department has reviewed prior commission permit awards only a year or two back. Uh, I wasn't here before, so when I did it, I went all the way back. And so I've noted any permits that were awarded that weren't listed on the applications. However, the only reason I can determine that is because the organizations have already given us that information. It's, it's somewhat redundant to ask the organizations to give us a list of things we already know and we we were part and parcel to um, and that would be under section E of the application and so that would be another area where the process could be improved streamlined um, that's just making them jump through hoops for information we already have As the Commission Chair stated, in reviewing all the applications and working to rectify any issues found in the audit, we identified several inconsistencies and issues in the regulation and application process. Um, so it would be the Department's uh, desire to have the regulation uh, addressed and looked at again to try to streamline the process um, so that we're not requesting information they've already provided us, um, such as what was in Section E. We need to clean up the inconsistency in the due date, improve the reporting requirements, and more clearly establish the specific documents to be provided and so forth, and such as records of how each, the amount of gain or the amount generated from the permit and how those funds were spent, uh, receipts and so forth. Uh, also, when we're opening the reg, we could even possibly take the opportunity to 
be about adding permits for other species. Uh, so there might be some other good candidates. Um, and that's that's kind of my, my prepared okay. statement. So if you don't have I, any I first want to know if any commissioners have any questions they want to yes. ask him of the things that they've researched. And I want to reiterate, four attorneys, four attorneys have, have spent countless hours going over this and, and found all these discrepancies that need to be cleaned up. And if we have now given uh, the commissioner the go ahead for, to start cleaning up, we're gonna start this right now. The only other process now left is we're gonna vote here in a minute, but we're gonna take a break. Here's, here's my proposal, is that we take about a 10 minute break. We come back and sit at this table in the presence of whoever wants to sit in here and we're gonna fill out our forms. Then I'm gonna ask two or three people to accompany those forms with, with a uh, completely independent individual and go count those and then they can come back and tell us those. Yes, Colonel. Doc, you said you would take um, discussion from the floor about improving the process. And just we've got a couple notes here. If you take it, if, if, if they're I'm short, sure the clock is running. Yeah, so if if they're short, short okay. that's okay. I, I, I think, right. I, I mean, our I, civilian, our civilian and, and uh, commission suggestions are pretty good, but four attorneys, right. four attorneys trump I, our. I understand. I'm talking about moving forward. Go okay, ahead. So moving forward, we have this, we've had discussion in here on multiple times, yeah. multiple dates that. The hunter that doesn't draw a commission permit and the hunter that pays for a commission permit would live by the same rules. We talked about that in here now. Like they'd have to also hunt by zone. Dr. Cross brought that up. Even if you buy a commission permit. So there has been some precedent that even if you get a commission permit, you would get it and have to hunt by the same rules and the same. So I would like to point out a couple things. The, the hunter that actually applies statewide applies by an online lottery. We've got a cumbersome paper process for a commissioner tag. We've also got a problem with when they, over the last five years, maybe not this year, when they arrived here or didn't arrive here. I might recommend that we have an automated process to submit the applications. It's nationwide, people submitting automated applications across the country and there's deadlines. There are states that have gone completely out of paper even for commissioner tags. Um, I would also recommend that they would be issued by lottery. That gets y'all off the hook. Uh, not that you're on the hook, you said it's an honor, but then it would be a lottery for the commission tag, the same as if it's a lottery for everybody else that's applying. So if, there, if they have a valid application, you would put it in, and if there's six tags by zone, now you don't have an inequity discussion and a second drawing for a zone. It'd be a lottery for drawing the commissioner tag once they're valid. That would match the regular hunter. And that would fix your at-large versus zone. And the last thing I would like to bring up is we blocked drawn hunters from three years to draw again. We've got folks from 501 c threes applying every single year and getting them every single year. Whether they're worthy or not, I would recommend that if we're blocking regular hunters who draw this year from drawing for the next three years, we would also have a block for charities drawing every single year to block them moving forward as well. Okay, so you blocked the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation that gave us the elk Dennis Tiger. No, I think that it's, okay, so I think it's valid that you consider certain entities different outside. Your foundation, for instance. Without the money the foundation raises, you're not going to put 5,000 kids through camp. I, I just want to clarify, you're not talking about a pure lottery. Well, you have, set, you have six zones. The regulation says up to 10. I think you could consider that there would be exempted organizations like RMEF that without their hundred thousand dollar initial investment, we wouldn't have enough. Okay, my, and, and I'm going to I'm going to stop you right there, Colonel. My, my suggestion, my, my suggestion at this my suggestion at this point is that my earlier comment about addressing the mic versus paperwork. My my suggestion to you is to to compile those things that your organization thinks and send them to Mr. Field. Because Mr. Field is going to be, he, he and the commissioner are going to be the two that are going to initially start looking into this, and then they're going to get input from from, uh, from Gabe, from Karen, from about three or four other attorneys. Anybody else before I call this break? Quickly, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. I, if we added up all your two minutes, you've, spent, you've talked more than I have today. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't know about that. Uh, Jeff Eaton, pray for me. Pray for me. I would remind this body that when you're, and, and the lawyers will, they'll, they'll begrudgingly back me up on this. When you read a legal, legal document and it says shall, 
You can replace that shell with the word must. It's not an option when it says shall. It but means but the must. shell there says shall be. Ground. Shall, shall be, be must be. Shall be what? Shall be ground. Or shall be grounds. Must be grounds. Grounds, not shall be. Up to you. Uh, okay. When if you look at the paper purpose, the stated purpose and bylaws of an organization, if those bylaws aren't consistent through their code <coughs> with the conservation project, if someone, if an organization to uh, save China dolls in China has submitted a change to their bylaws in the last 60 days that says we want to conserve those mm -hmm. those China dolls in China, that should not be a, a qualifier. Right. Uh, the reporting failures that I saw in my audit of the last five years were the money wasn't spent right. Well, we, we cleaned that up. That's one of the items yes, to clean sir. up. In and when you talk about uh, conservation, there's a legal definition, 150.7 has a legal definition for conservation, and it doesn't include a lot of the things that I saw money being spent on. Okay. And that's a public issue, but it, it's of concern. Thank okay. you. Yes, sir. I, my, 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 hang on. Go ahead. Larry, do, yes, do you apply for one of these tags? No, sir, no, I do not. They're, they're not. I, I'm, I'm a dog in this I, I just have one C4. question. Why are you here? Because I got 242 emails and texts yesterday in the 24 hours after I posted my, my synopsis of what happened the last five years. Okay. The sportsman and, and my, and my membership enough. has put me and, here. Good enough. And again, Mr. Richards, my suggestion is that you put this to print and that Mr. Fields get a copy. Yes, that sir. way he can peruse all of the suggestions and concerns of sportsmen across the state. That's why I said we want to hear those, but the microphone is probably not the best place. The best place is an email or direct contact or telephone. Okay, I'm going to take a 10 minute break. All the commissioners at least need to come back because we're going to sit down and do our voting and then we'll count votes. Thank you for 10 minutes. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Got her damn name. It's not a secret vote. It's got our name on it. Yeah. You just check outside. You just put a check outside. No, I think it's supposed to be a thing.
14 people applied. How many officers do you? 14, 14 people applied, and you picked 10 of them. Okay, thank you. As long as it's a star, you can only pick one. Yeah. Thank you. Which on the waterfowl, you're basically just picking one of them, and then everybody else gets one. I didn't get that. I need three more. Oh. I'm going to take three. Huh? You don't have to vote for them. You don't want to. You can vote for them. You don't have to vote for them. You can let everybody else be bad guys. Started late. Okay, and then on turkeys we got ten and then what you can't do without coffee. Can't do without coffee. We use our bills. copying off me, I can tell you. This calculus should be all right, but not chemistry. We put them back in our package. Hey, Doc, Doc, they found those men. You're all the ones. It shall be our prayer that we don't have any more of those hunts. See, they policy or preference, something like that was the words you used, so we're continuing to have it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is your duck, is your duck hole still here? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I mean, you can't plan anything. Yeah. Yeah. Most, most of the we didn't want them to have it anymore. Because you know, it's not in any of the numbers. That, that, that water that went out. Everybody's at the table. I could have made these the first one. That part, yeah. Ken, the cake is for the The cake has been baked. The cake has been baked. I just want you all to see. When you see that green light by where the other is still on. So it's still for the point right there. I didn't feel like I should pass this out until after we vote. It's only good to be. Is there anybody out there? Okay, Doug. What? Where does everybody stand? How many more we still got outside? Is everybody, sit? Is everybody done? Okay. If you'll notice on your agenda today, gentlemen, it says the next suggested committee meeting August the 9th. 
for those of you out in the public, you might want mark on your calendar August the 9th, and the commission meeting suggested is September the 13th. Does anybody have any conflicting schedules with that? Anybody going to Acapulco and not is taking it? me? The 9th is a little tough for me. The 9th? Mm -hmm. So, I say that, of course, that's a Friday. That's the 9th's a little tough, or night, uh, the 9th is completely out for you? Well, it doesn't tell me yet. Okay. Could we could we consider moving these a week farther out? Everybody take a look at it. So I've got one dissenter right now. Tell, tell me what I didn't say center, one dissenter and somebody. That's your that's your program, Mr. E. So anybody here got a got a problem with that? Anybody got any big vacation plans? So no, it would be right now. August the, what, what is that next date? Somebody look at the calendar. A week from August the 9th. August 16th. 16th. 16th? I'll, be in, I'll be gone that whole week. That's why he's The 17th. I'll, I'll make the 9th work. It's fine. Okay. If, if that be the case, and I hate to put the pressure on uh, Ken there, but August the 9th and September 13th, so all of you mark your calendars, that will be the next meeting. Is there any further business? Now, some of you may want to hang around to hear results. Is there any further business before the commission today? Mr. Hayes. I'm getting out of the way so you can see the clock. I, this, it, won't, this won't take, take long, Doctor. I'm just uh, representing the League of Kentucky Sportsmen, and I'm finishing my presidential term tomorrow. So I'll not, not be representing the League uh, at present anymore. It, go, it, it goes on the record, uh, uh, thank you for you, your service, your conservation, and your conservation. Thank you, sir. Any other business before? Be a stranger, <laughs> Any other business before the commission? I will entertain, and believe me, I will entertain it. A motion to adjourn. A motion to adjourn. So moved. I have a motion to adjourn and it's seconded. All in favor? I want to uh, amend that a motion. <laughs> <laughs> Again. You just got put on some subcommittee, and I'll figure it out. Thank you all. We're adjourned. I told you that we won't get But I thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, you make me have to come see you, professional. I have been mowing yards. Yes. I mow four yards every week. My father-in-law, my neighbor, the guy, and the dog. Well, that wasn't pretty easy. I'm gonna have the colonel walk me out to the car now. <laughs> I, either either one, he's probably on. And I usually, you know, when, I, when I'm out of uniform, it's hard for me. I feel for him. I told my wife one time, you know, I forget the cell phone. But after, after 28 years of maybe, after 28 years of being a sworn officer, I, I feel naked if I don't Thank <laughs> you.